Good morning, members. Um, we have a quorum, and can I call the meeting to order? I declare the meeting open to the public. Can I welcome Deputy Chair Pam Cameron, uh, Pat Sheehan, or Leah Flynn, Colin McGrath, who are joining us by phone, by telephone conferencing this morning, in order to maintain physical distancing guidelines, and thank you for that. And can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? So, um, apologies. Do we have any apologies? No apologies. Uh, are, are members aware of any other apologies? No, thank you. So, chairperson's business then. Uh, we have received some uh, correspondence from the Autism Society there, which we will be discussing later as part of our correspondence. And in terms of media, I did interviews yesterday with Good Morning Ulster and Talkback in relation to, largely in relation to the care home sector. So I now draw members' attention to our draft minutes. Item three, uh, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 26th of March, which are tab 3.1 of the meeting pack. Are members content with those minutes? Content? Content on the phone? Yep. Thank you. May I also refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 2nd of April, which are at tab 3.2 of your meeting pack. Are members content with that set of minutes? Content. Content. Thank you. And finally, in relation to minutes, I refer you to the meeting held on the 9th of April, which are at tab 3.3 of the meeting pack. Are members content with those minutes? Content. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I can advise members that there are no matters arising from the minutes. So we move on now to the COVID-19 disease response briefing from the Public Health Agency. I advise members that officials from the PHA are joining us by telephone conference, conferencing this morning to discuss the COVID-19 testing strategy and related matters. Can I refer members to the testing strategy, which is tab 5.1? and a letter raising issues for social workers at 5.3. Members will also be aware of the revised guidance on PPE referenced at tab 5.4. So I would now like to welcome and just to check that we have with us uh, Olive McLeod, Chief Executive. Olive, are you there online? Yes, good morning. Okay, we're also hoping we have Professor Hugo Van Weerden, Director of Public Health. Hugh, Professor, are you there? Good morning. Good morning. And Mr. Rodney Morton, Director of Nursing. Are you there, Rodney? Yes, good morning. Good morning, Rodney, and thank you all for joining us. So um, I suppose then I'll go back to uh, yourself, Olive, there. Do, would you like to go ahead and brief the committee? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity of speaking with you this morning. Um, at, in these very difficult and different circumstances that we find ourselves in, I, I appreciate that you'll have many questions you'll want to raise, and you have been introduced to my colleagues here this morning. Um, I've been working as the interim chief executive of the Public Health Agency for just a number of weeks. However, the staff of the agency have been working from the beginning of January on this evolving public health emergency. Since the 22nd of January, the PHA have operated together with the Health and Social Care Board, the BSO, as health silver within the gold, silver, bronze emergency planning management structure across health and social care um, to support the management of the pandemic. Within this structure, we have clear processes for helping to anticipate, to mitigate, to manage and escalate risks and issues across health and social care partners under the oversight of the Department of Health colleagues. These are tried and tested arrangements which have been designed and tested for situations, including this pandemic. It's important to remember and to remind ourselves of the work that we have done to date, and from the public health perspective, the work, for example, we have done. So there's an infrastructure to support health and social care silver, including a range of silver subcommittees. There are health protection, surge, PPE, social and community care, human resources, just to name a few. We have implemented mechanisms to safely provide testing for symptomatic individuals. 
We've established a system of contact tracing. We have provided advice on self-isolation and activities. We have liaised with the four nation public health groups to share emerging knowledge. Um, we have provided advice to both professionals and the public. We've worked with the regional virology lab to establish local testing. We've scoped hospital capacity to assess uh, uh, their, the initial threat of COVID. Um, we have provided infection co control advice. We've secured cross-trust agreement on the management and transport of the very first case. Uh, we've, we've worked across with the Health and Social Care Board and the Trust and Northern Ireland Blood Transfusion Service um, for its readiness. We've worked with the Regional Laboratory and Microbiology Network. Uh, we have assessed and coordinated critical care escalation planning. We've coordinated and clinically engaged on regional proposals for ventilators. We have worked with the Health and Social Care Board on the diagnos diagnostic and treatment capacity, including CTs and oxygen supplies. We have coordinated the clinical com uh, engagement on a complex proposal for pediatric services. Um, including the reduction to three sites to release capacity. Um, these are, uh, these are a, a list of the number of issues that we have been dealing with in the last number of weeks. Um, much remains to be done as we have yet to reach the peak of the pandemic here in Northern Ireland. And I want to assure you and your committee that the Public Health Agency will continue to play a leading role working in partnership with partners across statutory and non-statutory sectors. However, I know you have many questions for us, so I'll pause now. Um, for okay, thank you, Olive. And can I just ask everyone on the phone to keep the phone quite close to and, and speak up? It's a little bit hard to hear there, some of the contributions. So if people can just be conscious of that, please. So, the first one from me, um, in terms of testing in care homes, now we are very aware at this point in time, given the experience there's been in other countries around the world, that the care home sector is a, as a site of particular vulnerability. We have some very vulnerable residents within those settings, and also the staff within, the, within those settings are vulnerable to exposure in the, in the care home settings and also to transfer of that uh, beyond the care home setting. So. There has been indications that people who have uh, symptoms will be tested and that will be subject to a risk assessment. And a lot of people, and myself included, feel this falls very far short of what is required, that what we actually need to be doing is testing people who are being admitted into care homes, people within the care home setting, and the staff within the setting. So can you advise on the nature and the approach of the risk assessment element of testing, and whether there are plans and what the plans are to move, as, as indicated by the Minister yesterday in the Assembly, that there's a move to scale up testing. So can you please outline for us what those issues are? So uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, if I can just give a very uh, introductory sentence to testing first of all, uh, and then address the questions that you've asked specifically in relation to the um, So uh, we have moved quite rapidly in Northern Ireland, uh, the way I would articulate it is from being able to do four tests a day, 40 tests a day, to 400 tests a day, and now to being close to doing 2,000 tests a day. Um, I would say that these tests are not tests that you can turn on and off, uh, just to, you know, it's as if they work instantaneously. They are very challenging tests, and the, the laboratories have worked relentlessly to um, delivering uh, the testing. We are in a good position in that the, there are no uh, outstanding waiting lists of staff or patients to be tested. So we are meeting the demand and have spare capacity in the system. And I think, as you're rightly pointing out, uh, there is an obligation on us to rapidly use that additional capacity as it continues to grow, uh, particularly with those who are most vulnerable. And one of those sectors is the care home and domiciliary care sector. So. Um, as you've said, when we had very restricted laboratory testing capacity in the early days, you know, say 40 to 400 tests per day, we, our approach to care homes was to test five individuals in a care home where we had two cases, 
which was to characterize and make sure that we understood what was happening. We uh, in, intensely focus on outbreaks in care homes. The health protection team here uh, work very intensely with any care home that has an outbreak and, and do so, for example, through the flu season in a similar way. So we have been, it's a rapidly changing uh, field, as you've noted and as the minister outlined. Um, we are moving now to testing everyone from the last few days. We're testing everyone in a care home where we have evidence of an outbreak. We're also doing a small study in a number of care homes to map the epidemiology in greater detail. Um, and we are in a position where we will provide testing for any member of staff who um, is symptomatic in any way, and there are circumstances in which their family members can be tested as well. We, I think, so I think that in comparison to other parts of the uh, Five Nations, we are doing relatively well at this point in time in relation to testing. And when, uh, when, when do you expect that those tests will be getting carried out on a regular basis within care homes? What's the time frame we're looking at? There is a working group which has been set up by the CMO but is uh, largely being led from within the public health agencies and colleagues in the department, which is working up plans so that we can do large-scale contact tracing in society. Um, in the care home sector, the, the number one thing is that we identify rapidly any outbreaks in care homes, that we provide good advice to the care home <clears throat> around hygiene, around the isolation of cases, the cohort nursing of cases, to make sure that we minimize spread um, and that we provide PPE to, to care homes and that we undertake swabbing in the care homes of anybody uh, who... <coughs> needs swabbing. What I'm trying to say is that that's a dynamically assessed uh, pattern that is going to change increasingly with increasing testing as we have capacity to do additional testing. Okay, but I'm still not getting a sense of, of when that's going to be, when that's going to be uh, in place. Are we talking days here or are we talking weeks? We, we are currently testing everyone who requires to be tested. There is no bottleneck. In terms including of staff, testing. Hugo? Yes, including staff. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and just, just on, that, on, that, on that point then, um, in terms of the, the staff who are taking the testing, there would appear to be some confusion around uh, the training in place to take these specific, uh, to take these specific swabs. Is that an issue that, that is of concern, and should that, should that guidance have been provided to care homes uh, more, more, in a more timely way? So I understand that district nursing will do it in residential settings, but in nursing home settings it will be, it will be nurses within the nursing homes. Are there issues there that you're concerned about? That's correct. I'll pass you on to Rodney to give you the details. So, uh, Chair, um, the position in relation to uh, supporting nursing homes is that the Infection Prevention Control and Health Protection Team here in the Public Health Agency uh, will support nursing staff within nursing homes uh, to undertake uh, the swabbing as well as providing infection prevention control uh, advice. Uh, and that, may, that also includes using the correct uh, personal protective uh, equipment in undertaking that swabbing procedure. But I would acknowledge that um, we do need to provide additional and further training. Uh, we'll be working with our clinic and education centre uh, to do so. Uh, in addition to that, I've uh, been working with colleagues in RQIA to hopefully this week issue some further guidance in relation to infection prevention control within care homes and also in terms of swabbing. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question then that I wanted to ask was in relation to um, contact tracing. And clearly the reason why we test is to identify who has the disease, who is potentially at risk of spreading that disease within the community. So the contact tracing is the actual purpose of, of why you test, so you can identify where the disease is and where there are potential clusters. In light of that, and in light of, in light of 
the fact that in the south this has been undertaken now for some weeks, uh, there's I think up to 1,500 people engaged in it. There's a system in place for data protection. There's a system in place for follow-up calls. Can you elaborate for us in terms of what planning is in place at that at this time to roll out the contact tracing, which will be which will be necessary once we do the testing? Can you elaborate what organisations are involved? How many people have been recruited to carry that out? And what the anticipated scale and plans are to roll that roll that contact tracing out in a meaningful way? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. I, I think you're touching on a really, really important topic um, and an area that I think has caused some concern because of the variation in approach over different jurisdictions. I think it's fair to say that um, the view of the PHA is that, as of today, across the whole uh, gamut of features of the COVID epidemic, um, it's not, I think we can make a, a strong case for saying that Northern Ireland is actually in the strongest position of the five jurisdictions that we might compare ourselves with. That is not to be complacent and not to say that that couldn't change even within 72 hours. But the methodology that has been followed here has been successful. That is not to say that there aren't other methodologies by which um, an approach you know, can be taken. We are, as I said slightly earlier, maybe it wasn't quite clear enough, uh, there is an, a working group uh, that is intensely focusing on the gearing up of additional testing. As the testing capacity increases, we need to use that testing capacity and we need to test a lot more people in the community. Um, that may be associated with slight changes to the lockdown uh, approach that is currently in place. So uh, particularly if changes are made to that, it will be even more important that we have very strong, robust testing approaches. We have identified that there are around 500 environmental health officers who are very happy to help us with testing. And there are a number of other groups, particularly the universities, where medical students and nursing students have been identified as, as willing to support um, large-scale testing approaches. There are a number of exact methodologies by which you can do that. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really important to say in this context is across the world what is increasingly happening is that technology is being used to contact trace. So mobile phone apps and uh, in particular can help us with the contact tracing approach, uh, identifying people who may have been inadvertently put at risk by somebody uh, who was probably shedding the virus. So there is intensive work on that. Um, it will report through to the CMO with some recommendations. And then, you know, if the, I think the CMO will then make a decision on the approach that he wishes to take. Very, uh, and a, a pro proposal um, around the development of that approach has been put to the CMO already. A brief update will be provided by the end of play tomorrow. And then, you know, I, as I say, this is an evolving picture, um, but there is intense focus on ensuring that as we grow the uh, capacity, we make absolute maximum use of it. And that is being overseen by an expert advisory group on COVID testing, which is uh, chaired by a uh, senior uh, well, I have, to, I have to say that, that that raises some concerns. Now, you have elaborated a bit in terms of testing and 500 environmental officers, university students prepared to help with testing. Part of the contact tracing is that people are able to provide advice on isolation. That can't be done, or that, that, that can't be as easily done by, app, by, by apps. I'm also concerned that we're considering using an app. This, this testing would need to be, the, the contact tracing element of it would need to be um, in place. So we haven't even signed off on the approach as to whether or not we're using the app. Is that correct? Sorry, I didn't quite catch a bit about the app. Are, are, you, t are you telling me you, that it's still being considered whether or not we will use an app for contact tracing or any other form of, of uh, human endeavour? Um, Northern Ireland has produced an app which um, is gathering some useful information. There is collaboration around an app 
which is being developed by NHSX, um, and there is global collaboration on the use of apps. For example, if you can have an app that spots who you've walked you know, close to uh, and been in close contact with over the previous, for example, seven days, then that is very useful information in terms of being able to say who might have been put at risk um, by an individual inadvertently during that phase when they had the virus but were not yet uh, quite uh, having symptoms. The, the, perhaps the most infectious period of time is the day or so before somebody starts symptoms when they may be shedding virus but not yet symptomatic and so uh, not aware that they may be putting other people at risk. But, but, I, I, but, this is, but this is essentially new technology and untested technology that we're, that we're planning at some point to rely on. I, I, I would be concerned about that, I have to say. I think there needs to be, there needs to be um, a very focused piece of attention put on this because this is not something that needs to happen in, in weeks' times. This needs to be happening as, along with the testing. We need to be in parallel ready to do that contact tracing, as you say, going back 48 hours before symptoms. We also live. We also live here in a, in a part of the world where there's very bad uh, coverage at times. I'm not sure how that impacts apps. I'm not sure if that approach has been robustly evidenced or tested as being effective. I know. I know that the approach of of other countries of actually making making calls to people has certainly been proven to be robust. So I think that's that's an issue we'll need to take a very a very very closer close look at. Um, I want. I do want to go to members now. Um, what I'm proposing. Provide you with an assurance that we have an established system for contact tracing, for providing advice on self-isolating and, and monitoring. And we did this at the outset of the of the the, uh, the, the pandemic. Well, what is that, Olive? Olive, Olive, what what is that system? What we have sorry, we have just described to you where we have recruited. 500 people who are currently been trained for testing. To, to, yes, for testing. I'm asking about um, contact tracing. Yes, this is contact tracing. We are, sorry, I'm going to hand over to Hugo here. Yeah, we, the we would never, we would never rely on an app in itself. No. To say the good, well tried tested approach where you phone somebody up, you go through where they've been, you go through who they've been in touch with, you phone those individuals up, you explain things to them. You know, that's a well tried and tested methodology. But Hugo, and, and do we have enough people in place, trained, ready to do that? That's my question. I, as, as the testing capacity comes on stream, I believe we will have that workforce in place, yes. Okay. Okay, I'm going, I'm going to go to members now. And what, what we propose to do is similar to last week, that we'll group, take two groups of questions. Uh, if members could all ask two succinct questions, please. And please, I'm conscious that last week some members stuck to that and other members didn't get a chance of, of a question because of uh, we run over time. We'll take a round of questions. This is just, just for yourselves, Olive and Hugo and Rodney. We'll take a round of questions on the testing issue and we'll then come back to the PPE guidance. So if you could take a note of the members' questions as we go through in relation to testing and then answer them after we've had the group of questions presented to you. Is that okay? So I'm going to go then uh, to, the, to the phone in order the people that came in there. So I'm going first to Deputy Chair Pam Cameron. Pam, are you there? I am, yes. Thank you, Chair. And thank you all for your attendance here at uh, committee this morning. Um, in terms of testing kits um, um, and in, ter in terms of the testing procedure, uh, I've been made aware um, in the last week or so about, uh, I'll give you the scenario, uh, a household which consisted of three junior doctors, one who developed symptoms, um, was promptly sent for testing, had their test done, um, but were not contacted within the time frame that they were told they'd be contacted back. Eventually, we're told that they had a void test result and needed a retest. And the, the outcome of all of that meant that all those three junior doctors were at home and unable to get to their place of work to do what they really need to be doing. So is there, is there going to be or is there a, a special um, emphasis put on those healthcare professionals who are absolutely on the front line 
that need to get back into the, the workplace as quickly as possible in terms of testing. That's the first question. The second one is on um, antibodies. And uh, do you know what the prospective timeline for validation of any potential antibody tests? Thank you. Um, Pat Sheehan, are you there? Yes, I am. You hear me? <coughs> yep. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Olive, Hugo and Rodney. Uh, I just wanted to focus uh, on the uh, contact tracing as well. I asked the Minister a question in the Assembly yesterday about it. Um, uh, we're aware that on the 12th of March that Public Health England made a policy decision to stop contact tracing entirely uh, across the water. A similar policy decision was taken here, presumably by the Minister. And I was just wanted to know why was that policy decision taken? Because the Minister in his response yesterday spoke about the first case that was detected here in the north, uh, a, a woman who had travelled through Dublin Airport uh, back to the north. Uh, and the Minister talked about a system of contact tracing had been put in place in collaboration with the HSE in the south. And all those the woman had come into close contact with were contacted. And we know that uh, the countries that have been most successful in suppressing the virus have those who have used a combination of measures of testing on a widespread basis, contact tracing, rigorous contact tracing, isolation and social distancing. So my questions are, why was a policy decision taken to cease contact tracing here, who made that decision, uh, and what or how many people are going to be required to put in place a rigorous system of contact tracing in the future? Thank you, Pat. Um, Orlea Flynn, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me okay, Chair? Yes, we can. Yep, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I regularly follow the, the daily surveillance reports that are being published by the PHA, and I would just be concerned around the limited scope um, of those that are being reported um, and tested. Now, I do understand there's issues around timing, um, but I don't think it's, it's the comprehensive testing and reporting system that, that we need at this time and I am aware of the ECDC document on the strategies for surveillance and I would just like to ask the panel um, do you think that the current surveillance system that we have in place is good enough to accurately inform the decision making um, that is being made from, from that core um, team headed up by the CMO that you spoke about um, and if that's not the case what do you think is missing? Thank you. Thank you Orlea. Um, Colin McGrath are you there? <coughs> Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, and thank you for the um, uh, presentation this morning. Um, I suppose maybe the, the first is just to get more detail about the uh, parameters and how you actually set the criteria for testing, because I, I get a little bit concerned whenever I hear that the testing that you're reaching, your capacity that you're reaching, the targets, but these are targets that you have set, and I think that there is a difference in expectation on the ground as to who should be and how often testing should be taking place uh, from what you're actually implementing as policy. And I think that people would be quite shocked today to hear that we actually have surplus in our daily testing regime. In other words, that we're, we, we, we do all the testing that we need to do, but we could be doing more whenever the view on the ground is very clearly that there needs to be more testing. So I'm a bit concerned and would like to have some explanation as to why we at this stage have capacity for testing uh, each day whenever there's that need on the ground. And if we think of the care worker going into somebody in, in, in the home, if we don't know, if that person is asymptomatic but has the virus and the proper protections aren't put in place, that's where the worry and the concern is coming from people on the ground. And the second question is, um, what work have you undertaken with your counterparts in the South to specifically um, instigate a testing and contact tracing regime on an all-island basis? Because we, need to, we really need to accept and understand that we live on an island and that people with the ferries not working and the airplanes not flying back and forward, our people are moving about on an island basis and that's the focus for contact tracing and testing. So can you tell me how that has been taken into consideration? 
Thank you, Colin. Um, coming now into the room, Paula. Okay, good morning, um, and thank you very much. My um, <coughs> question follows on very much from Col Colin's there. Um, you may be aware that out of Dublin today and tomorrow, there are three flights to Romania, and I'm assuming that these are repatriation flights, but I'm aware that there are members of the Roma community from my constituency in South Belfast who are going to be on those flights. How are you going to manage at the far side of, of them coming back? And they're entitled to do so. But in terms of the cultural um, and linguistic complexities around that, obviously there's going to be a need for population surveillance around that. And how are you going to manage that? That's the, the first question. The second question relates to the news bulletin there this morning. I think they'd, the BBC were at the SSE Arena testing centre for an hour and nobody turned up. Is that um, an Easter issue or are there wider some, um, systemic problems in the system in terms of the referral system. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, Alex? Um, yes. Um, it's my understanding that we can do a thousand tests a day and that's not been reached. Is there any particular reason why that's not happening? And to try and get my head around this contact tracing, just looking at it logically, and I'm not saying I'm right or I'm wrong or what, but it appears to me that contact tracing is impossible because so many people now have the virus. To be able to have the resources to do that is practically an impossibility. Would that be your assertion? Thank you, Alex and Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks for the, the presentation there. Following on from Alex's point, um, I think it's with the capacity for 1,100, I think, mm -hmm. tests to be carried out a day. I think that Monday's figure was 456 or there or thereabouts. So I'm concerned that uh, testing isn't ramped up quick enough. And when I ask um, the PHA officials whether they think uh, enough has been done already around testing, I just want to uh, share some concerns raised by the Chair around contact tracing uh, as well. Thank you, Jerry. And Alan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I, I, a member of my family has worked in the uh, care home environment for many, many years and uh, has reported to me it's very, very difficult to control uh, even the, the, the seasonal vomit and diarrhea bugs once they get into a care home environment. Indeed, the staff go down with it as well. Uh, so the, a lot of these care homes have been in lockdown for some weeks. Uh, no visitors coming in, uh, and obviously the, the, the vulnerable people who are resident in those homes are not picking this virus up spontaneously. It's, it's obviously been brought to them. Uh, so what views would the panel have as, as to how the virus is getting in to the care home environment and what steps are being taken uh, to mitigate uh, against that? I know it's impossible to uh, completely avoid uh, something like this coming into the home, but what steps have been taken to mitigate it? And also, in the care home environment, are residents who are showing symptoms, are they being uh, uh, removed as a matter of routine to hospital uh, to prevent further spread uh, within the home, or is the responsibility on the, uh, the, the home management uh, to try and uh, look after the treatment of that person who's shown the symptoms and to try and avoid uh, the, the virus spreading to other residents. Okay, thank you, Alan. And that's the final question there at this point in time on the testing issue for the panel. Um, would you go ahead and, and please try to work your way through those questions? You yeah, know, um, I think the questions that are being asked are, are incredibly important questions and that um, reflect both the wider societal concerns and very much the anxieties that frontline uh, staff I know are expressing uh, to Emily's. And I think that um, it is important that those concerns are taken uh, very seriously and that um, maybe we do need to do more to communicate to provide the reassurance that uh, the, the approach that we are using would be, I believe, internationally recognized as a very robust one. And as I said already, I am of the view that at the moment, Northern Ireland uh, is in uh, the best position of the five countries when one looks at the numbers at a high level across testing, across admissions to hospital, across ICU. Our admissions to hospital are falling. Are, we are discharging more people than we are admitting. 
the numbers in ICU are falling, death will lag behind. They will continue to rise probably for the next two or three weeks. None of these uh, parameters are free from being queried. You know, somebody can say, well, you know, your data may be weak. But I do believe that actually Northern Ireland is currently in the best position. That's not an excuse. So testing, let me try and pick up the testing. As I tried to say in the opening remarks, um, these tests are not tests that one just, as it were, pushes a button and, and one has an answer. They are um, challenging to undertake. The Belfast Laboratory has used a variety of different tests because of challenges with the test. We have had machines break down at times. We have had there's a global shortage of some of the reagents at times. There's been intense work, and we have done very well uh, as a system to keep uh, that ramping up very rapidly, probably proportionately higher than other uh, five nations that we might compare against. Um, there are different types of tests. There's the, there's the test for the DNA of the virus, or you know, PCR testing, as it's called, and then there's testing for the antigens, for the uh, proteins that are on the surface of, of the virus. N none, none of those tests are perfect tests. You're taking a tiny sample, either from a swab, which may not pick up everything that's there, or for a, from a very, very small amount of blood. And when you think of the volume of the blood, you, you may easily miss virus that is in the blood. And of course, one has to remember that this isn't a blood infection primarily, it's an infection in cells. So it only spills into the blood when there's a lot of virus. So a negative test doesn't, is not, does not automatically mean that that person hasn't got the virus. Um, and so a testing is really important, but it's only one tool in the toolbox. Um, and the analogy that I've used is that a good tradesman may you know, do the same job relying on slightly different tools in the toolbox, but do an equally good job. And I think that is part of the context here. Testing, contact tracing, and um, social distancing are all tools in the toolbox. And they can be used in fractionally different ways. There are some common broad principles, but the, there are nuances to that. So then I'll try and answer the question about the, the gap between the capacity and what is uh, actually being used. The most important thing to say, I think, is that for over a week now, nobody has, as far as we're aware, been held up. In other words, there's not been a, a backlog, a queue of people in the system waiting to be tested. The laboratories have worked relentlessly to meet all the requests that are being asked of. But there is, um, as testing capacity increases, one simultaneously has to increase the number of people that one offers the test to. And um, the expert panel, the expert advisory group, has produced clear guidance which has been revised uh, several times, often on at least a weekly basis, listing priorities. So you start with the highest category of people to test, then category two, three, four, five, six, as it were. And so when you know that your top categories are fully saturated, you move on to the next group to be tested. That, that has been very well worked through. We've worked you know, into the independent sector, into the care home sector, into family members of these people who require testing. The next big stage, as we said, would be do you do large-scale testing in the population as a whole to, uh, with, contact, with a combination of contact tracing. Um, and as I said, there's a working group considering on the tools in the toolbox and the best way to deploy them. We were, we're also moving ahead. Somebody asked about antibody testing. Um, we are planning that there is what could be zero prevalence studies, so we can do studies of the population that we know the percentage of the population who have been infected with the virus. And um, that is dependent on the regulators authorizing antibody tests for use in such circumstances. But it's close collaboration both with the Republic of Ireland around the development of antibody tests that we can use 
and other parts of the United Kingdom where uh, tests are being developed by academics and industry. And as soon as those tests are authorised and available, we will be in a position uh, to use them. We're working closely with academics from the universities in Northern Ireland to assure that our methodology around that is uh, robustly developed with uh, senior academic advice. Um, looking through the questions that I can recall, the Roma community, there is a particular recognition of groups such as the Roma community and their needs, and there is an, a proactive program uh, led by the Belfast Trust around the needs of the Roma community. Other groups that have, are being considered as like fishermen, uh, who you know, are another group, who, um, and the homeless, there has been intensive work around those particular uh, vulnerable groups who I, you know, I think are rightly being pointed out as needing uh, additional support. So that would be my uh, remark at this stage. Oh, okay, there's a number of elements there that haven't been. Um, so in relation to our latest question around surveillance, what surveillance is in place within the community at the present time? There is um, a, a survey of 1,000 people uh, a week which is being undertaken um, by NISRA, which is uh, asking people symptom <coughs> questions uh, around their, um, their symptoms, as it were, which is a way of trying to have a sense of what is happening in the community. And as I say, we also um, get feedback from the admissions to hospital and the the, the admissions to intensive care unit and the deaths, all of which give us a sense of the pattern uh, in the community. Uh, does that answer the question or was there a component I missed? Or Leah, does that answer your question? <coughs> yes, Chair, it was really just with the, the surveillance reports that are, <coughs> that are being released. Um, you know, can the, the panel identify any guests um, within that current system, is there anything missing in their view or we're at the minute? I think that um, we are producing a daily, the theory of a, a daily report is that it is not primarily focused more on timeliness than on accuracy. We then would produce other reports that would have a more bespoke focus. Um, but the capacity to do so has been limited so far. We're working intensely with the department who are working on a dashboard that uh, would be made available to the public and that that would then re release some expertise within the surveillance community to produce more bespoke analyses, um, or more niche analyses for specific uh, topics, as it were. So there is also that uh, recognition that there's the opportunity to do um, more detailed deep dives into particular aspects of the pandemic um, over the next month or so. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to go through some of these quickly and ask for just a direct answer. In relation to Pat, and I'm going to group Pat and Jerry's question, in relation to the question, how many people do you assess will be required to do the contact tracing that's necessary and, and has enough been done at this point um, in relation to contact tracing? So, for phase one, up to 500 people, but kept under close uh, review. Okay. Um, in relation to uh, the question that Alan asked, are residents with COVID-19 being removed to hospital from care home settings? Where appropriate, yes. Okay. Um, in terms of the, uh, the lack of take-up on testing, the, there appears to be a gap between what's available currently. <coughs> Is that to do with referrals? Is it to do with public messaging? Why are those Why are those tests, in your view, that are available at this time and at some on some days not being availed of? I think it's about people who might make the referral and um, not wanting to overload the system. So we are encouraging people to increasingly come forward who might be holding themselves back. <coughs> they might benefit from doing so. 
Okay, and that sort of leads us into Colin, Colin's question around what are the parameters and criteria for testing, and if there's further scope at the minute, are those being rapidly increased to allow more people to be contacted and advised to, to take up test, and also in terms of coordinating on an all-island basis in, in the contact tracing, what, uh, what has been done uh, across, the, across the island between yourselves and authorities in the south? So there is a, both a test strategy and guidance which is reviewed on an approximately weekly basis. It's refreshed on an approximately weekly basis as, uh, in collaboration with the five uh, nations, nation approaches. Um, in terms of cross-boundary, there is close working between the health protection team here and the health protection team in the Republic of Ireland. Recognition of the importance of that, um, particularly as you say, um, at, at, at a border, there's individuals uh, where that is particularly important. There is academic collaboration across the modelling cell, which is looking at modelling, and university um, work as well around a col collaboration to ensure that um, with sharing of data for um, research purposes and informing policy. Okay, and in relation to in relation to the policy decision to stop tracing on the 12th of March that was brought in by the <coughs> British government, was that a mistake? As I tried to say earlier on, the, you know, different tradesmen will use different tools in the, in the same toolbox in a slightly different way to do the same job. Um, and I believe that some of the reflections that one has in different groups are perhaps expressing um, that preferential style that individuals will have. What, in your view, Hugo? If, if, we have, if we have lost ground on the testing how, and tracing, how are we going to make that up? Well, as I tried to indicate earlier, the fact that Northern Ireland is, that the data at the moment and shows Northern Ireland to be in a very strong position, um, would not indicate that any decisions that have been taken so far in relation to that have been problematic. Okay, and just I suppose to wrap this section up before we go into PPE, you referred to a global shortage of reagents, and I am aware that the the South have moved, I think, to to secure supply for some 900,000 tests over a period of time. Now that the memorandum of understanding is in place, is it is it possible for us to um, coordinate our efforts with the South to get to get uh, to address that issue of a lack of reagents? I think that they are a really important partner in, in this issue of reagents. I, I would strongly agree with you on that. Okay. Oh, yeah, just a follow up here quickly from well, Paula. The, the issue around the cultural and linguistic um, sensitivities around population surveillance hasn't been addressed, I don't think. Yeah. So the issue around cultural and linguistic sensitivities with, with uh, some of our, our uh, diverse communities, how have, how have you dealt with those? Uh, language issues and cultural issues in relation to this <coughs> this crisis? I, I mean, there has been work to ensure that translators are available. I know that there were uh, questions around um, different sign language uh, use as well, which has been important to address. And I think there is a recognition of the importance of, of uh, maintaining a sensitivity towards that important issue. Well, I, I have to actually, I will concur with Paula there. I don't think there's been enough done on that. In, in my own, in, in the South Tyrone area end of, of our uh, constituency, over almost 15% of the population have come here from another country. And I don't see any evidence where that community are being engaged with directly or in a way that, that suits them. I don't see, has there been, has there been guidance issued in Tatum, in Polish, in, in all those languages? Um, I, I think you're touching on an important point. It is really important that we provide information in different languages. Um, some of that has been led by the departments in London um, in translation into a very wide range of languages. And there is um, the top 10 languages uh, in Northern Ireland have been the immediate focus. Uh, but you're right in saying that it is important that we continue to 
that SNAI's particular communities uh, and get feedback from them as to when um, the information that they're providing isn't um, suitable in languages that they particularly need. Okay, well, I, I, I do think... In Many members of those communities are particularly vulnerable. Language is one thing. They also tend to live within higher density housing. They're in precarious work. And I think that what the PHA should be considering doing at this point in time is engaging directly with community leaders within those communities to assist your communication to them uh, so, that, so that you can work, work more closely with them. I think that would warrant a kind of a specific approach here, given, given the very diverse nature of some of our, some of our populations. Okay, I'm going to move oh, on then. Colin, yep. Colin, sorry. Yes, Pat. <clears throat> could, I, could I just uh, ask for some clarity? Because I'm, I'm just uh, not sure in terms of the answers around contact tracing we got there. Just two very, very short questions. Uh, is there, going by what we've been told by Shane Devlin last week and a letter I received from the Trust uh, this week, there is absolutely no contact tracing taking place at the moment. And when can we expect contact tracing to start? I mean, two short questions. There is contact tracing under, being undertaken in a number of contexts, but not of the, in the same uh, methodology that is being used in, in the Republic of Ireland. We, we recognise that these approaches have been different we would, for example, um, a comial infection means infection that's spread from person to person in hospital um, is an area where we, we, would, we intensively assess the spread, and that sits under infection control uh, as well as public health. Um, the community component that is being undertaken in the Republic is being, the, the approach is different in, in relation to that specific area at present. Well, Hugo, could I just say that I wrote to the Belfast Trust around two members of staff in Muckamore Hospital testing positive for COVID-19, and there was no follow-up contact tracing within the hospital at all, and the uh, Belfast Trust confirmed that. Well, we can, if we can get the details, we will definitely pick up on that as a specific incident. I'm grateful for you, your pointing it out. Yeah, you, you can follow up with that, Pat. Uh, with, with PHA directly, maybe. Okay, I'm going to move on now, members, to the issue of guidance around PPE. Um, and I know that, that that will have... I'm going to actually do that slightly different this time because we had to cover double back a wee bit there. So I'm going to go to the members in the same order, but I will ask for, for a quick, a single, a single question uh, at this point in time, a single question, short question, and a short response, please. Um, what I would like to ask in relation to that, that social work home visits have been an area of concern for social workers. Uh, so child safety yard and visits and that, it can be very difficult to maintain two metre dis social distancing. Social workers have raised concerns about the lack of PPE in those circumstances and the lack of, of guidance around the PPE, which is, it is also crucial. So will, will guidance for social workers engaging in home visiting be published? And how is the system addressing this type of risk and concern in social work? And I will just declare my own interest in that, that I, that I have previously come from a social work background myself, and I do understand that the dynamics around those home visits can be difficult anyway. De dealing with, dealing with uh, an infectious disease adds an extra element of concern. So how are you addressing those concerns in social work? It's Rodney here. Uh, the short answer to that question, um, as outlined in the guidance, uh, is that there are three factors have to be taken into consideration with respect to TPA. One, um, the nature of the task being undertaken. Two, the level of risk that the individual believes that they may be at with respect to that task. And, and three, uh, organisational risk assessment. Rodney, Rodney, sorry to interrupt you there. Can you speak up a little? It's quite hard to hear there. Or move a bit closer to your phone, maybe. Okay. Apologies for that, Chair. Um, That's better. So what I was trying to say was that uh, there are three factors that have to be considered uh, for all health and social care practitioners. One is primarily the nature of the task being undertaken, particularly if it takes that practitioner within two metres. Two, 
um, the level of risk that the individual practitioner feels that they may be exposed to, and three, um, the organisational assessment. So, for example, each healthcare care provider should uh, have a risk assessment uh, to indicate what level of PPE would be required in line with the guidance. In respect of social work, um, there's been a significant amount of work done by our social work cell a, in issuing guidance to um, health and social care practitioners, including social work, and I understand the department have done some further work in relation to social workers working in children's services, which I understand will be issued shortly. Is it, is it the case that the current guidance only deals with direct care, where, and, and social workers obviously are not providing direct care, but may still be within two metres? Is that correct? So that's why I said earlier on, Chair, that it's the nature of the task. So the, 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 there are two other pieces of uh, related guidance. So in the context of the PHG guidance, um, we look at those who are vulnerable and shielded, and those who have either confirmed COVID-19 or those who might be suspected. So as, as part of the risk assessment, if a child, a young person or an adult meets any of those criteria, then our advice is that uh, staff members should be wearing appropriate levels of PPE. Okay, okay um, so I'll go then to Pam Cameron. And, and if I could just say to any members, if, if you don't have a question or your question's already be answered, that's fine. You can just pass on. But I'll, I'll, I'll touch in with each of you in turn to ensure that you have had an opportunity. So, Pam, can you? Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just on the back of your question, in, in particular, uh, re social workers, that is a, is a big concern. I had asked the question last week to Sean Holland, and it uh, wasn't really a very positive response back, in that um, I understand maybe guidance has changed since then um, around the use of PPE for social workers in particular. I mean, obviously, uh, in terms of treating mentally unwell persons within the community, you can have a very real difficulty in assessing what type of PPE would be necessary, given that the circumstance can change very, very rapidly, given uh, maybe um, the state of a particular person's mental health at that particular time and place. So how, how do social workers protect themselves um, to the best of their ability in that type of circumstance? So... Uh First, first and most important thing is that in every care situation that a risk assessment is done, and that's crucial because the social worker, indeed any healthcare professional, hopefully will understand the individual with whom they're working. Um, so uh, the guidance does require each healthcare care practitioner uh, to do a risk assessment, particularly if that individual is in the vulnerable or shielded group. And in that context, any health social care practitioner, including social workers, should wear appropriate levels of PPE. Uh, where that is uncertain, uh, the guidance would suggest that, as a minimum, uh, the practitioner should wear PPE where they're, where they're concerned about the level of risk. Okay, thank you. Um, Pat? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, this is a more general question um, about PPE, that more and more countries are instructing uh, the population to wear masks while out in public, uh, and the evidence seems to be becoming stronger that it is advantageous in terms of stopping the transmission of the virus. Have uh, any discussions taken place here between PHA and the department? in regard to instructing citizens to wear masks and have any plans been put in place to ensure sufficient masks can be procured for the population? Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Yep. Anna? Um, it's Hugo Van Roden here. Um, Rodney, I think, will also want to come in on this one. There is a scientific advisory group for emergencies which advises the four CMOs and ministers and um, which is the group that is authorised with undertaking um, the evaluation assessment of particular interventions such as the, as the one that's been raised. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that the, 
there is an awareness of the, the, the World Health Organization's um, exploration of this issue and um, a recognition of the need to, for it to be explored at that stage group. I think my own per personal reflection is <coughs> if anybody wants to, to wear a homemade mask or a mask that is not drawn from a resource that would reduce availability for health and social care workers, then I, I couldn't see any circumstances which one would say, you, you know, that that was um, a, a, an unwise thing to do. Um, but I think at the moment that would be an individual choice for an individual. Um, you know, but as I say, the situation is recognised as, as a question that uh, is, is hanging out there and, and will eventually, I'm sure, have a slightly more formal answer. Thank you. Uh, I, would, I don't really have much to add that other than to say that I do know that uh, it has been discussed at the National Infection Prevention Control Fair. Uh, so I think there are discussions and debates going on, but I don't think a policy position has uh, been defined yet. Thank you, Rodney and Hugo. Um, or Leah, do you have a question this section? Yes, yes, please. Um, you had mentioned that the, the PHA and the BFO, along with others, are part of uh, the gold management team on the COVID. And we're constantly hearing, obviously, that PPE is still an issue um, in car homes, GPs, other places. Um, and just yesterday, the minister confirmed that he is launching an investigation into the issue. So I just wanted to ask, would you regularly see documents on internal um, stock checks of the PPE within the system? Um, and could you share these documents with the committee going back um, as far back as February, I suppose, if you have them? Yes, panel, please. So the first comment I, I'd make about that is that, um, of, of course, you will all be aware there are significant challenges across the world in relation to PPE. Um, we here in Northern Ireland have been working extremely hard, and I know, although I can't speak from a business service organisation colleagues, I know that they have continued really, really hard to source uh, additional levels of PPE and have been doing so for several, several months. So I wouldn't want to underestimate the challenge, of course. Um, however, um, I can say to you that uh, over 29 million items of PPE have been pushed out to our health social care organisations. And I can also say that our BSO colleagues have somewhere in the region of 91 million or, um, items ordered in relation to PPE. And the reason I share those numbers is just to indicate to you the level and scale of activity around trying to secure uh, PPE. Indeed, very locally, uh, we've engaged a number of manufacturers, for example, in the production of visors, uh, and orders placed up to 30 million uh, visors. So I'm sharing that with you just in level of a commitment that has been made both by our colleagues in BSO um, and also uh, our department colleagues in procurement to ensure that we do have uh, at least uh, levels of stock of our PPE. Um, so I, I think you know, all I can say to you is that every effort is being made uh, in order to ensure that we have the right level of PPE for our staff. And of course that means appropriate use of PPE as well. Okay, uh, Rodney, you seem to have switched something on or off there that has caused it to become a little bit echoey. So, just if there's if there's something you can you can do that. We we can't hear you, but it's a wee bit a wee bit more difficult. Um, going now to Colin. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I suppose my question really um, is in terms of PPE is about maybe for staff within the office environment. Um, and I think of the example that I used last week in the assembly about the open environment of, of an open office in the health and social care services where 25 staff operate out of it and 13 of the staff um, are currently off work with uh, symptoms of uh, coronavirus. And that includes social workers and district nurses and other community-based staff. D does the panel feel that um, the... Uh, guidance that is there, which is forcing people to come to work because it says they're essential service users, but is there proper measures in terms of the office environment that they work in to prevent people catching uh, the virus in this manner? Thank you, Colin. Hannah? 
Um, I think you're raising an important question. Um, I think that the, the essentialness of an essential worker varies, doesn't it? So if somebody is in theatre operating on a patient, you cannot stand two metres apart because you cannot get round the person that you're operating on by standing two metres apart. So it's, it's, as I say, very, very clear that it is completely essential that people are not operating within a two-metre space. Um, a nurse who is uh, bed-bathing a patient cannot stand two metres from that individual. As you then move outwards, as it were, in concentric circles to individuals who are performing essential work within the health and social care system, but at a more managerial or, or administrative level, I think that it comes down to more individual risk assessment and then a, a responsibility on managers to consider the needs of their individual teams. We know that within the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Agency, there has been uh, a regular recognition and review of that, both at organizational level, at the level of directors, and at the level of individual managers with um, advice thought as is appropriate for, from occupational health. And again, recognition that some staff may have uh, conditions that they wish to keep confidential um, and not to disclose to their manager, and that we have to exercise sensitivity in relation to that issue, and that if an individual says that um, they wish to be treated in a particular way, even if they are part of an essential worker group, I think that sensitivity is required in that kind of context. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I think one can do simple things, uh, you know, back to the, the, the old simple messages about um, hand washing, about uh, avoiding surfaces that might be contaminated, regular cleaning, trying to have good airflow through uh, an area that um, people are working in, and regular review of the capacity to undertake work from home. Um, so that holistic risk assessment uh, being done on a dynamic, ongoing basis, I think is the best approach to that. That would be my okay. reflection. Okay. So if you want to comment. And, and the Thank only you. thing I would say is that the social distancing rules still apply uh, in work environments. So where that is practicable, well, um, I thought it should be it here too. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, I'm just conscious of time, so just asking both both members and panel to be as, as succinct as possible. Paula, please. Um, thank you. My question relates to your assessment of the provision of scrubs for our frontline healthcare workers. Um, I, I believe there was there are some filtering through the system. Um, late in the day, might I add, um, but there are concerns that they're only getting one set. And they're having, after a long, arduous day, having to go home and boil wash them and bring them back and potentially bring infectious diseases into their home. Or they have the option then of going to the laundries in the trust and they're saying that there can be delays in getting their clothes back. So I just want your assess assessment of how the issue of scrubs is being handled. So just a couple of comments on that. First of all, um, I, I can't comment on the volume of scrubs because I don't have that data in front of me. But just to say that I know, again, uh, local manufacturers have been producing significant levels uh, of scrubs uh, for our hospitals. Um, some of the products we use and some of the items we use are reusable. And obviously, if, a, if an item is reusable, uh, appropriate decontamination procedures should be applied. And in each of our health social care organisations, there are infection prevention control teams who will guide practitioners about how to safely decontaminate any reusable items. Okay. Um, Alex? Yes. Um, just to confirm, I, I did ask yesterday um, in the statement from the Minister, um, can private sector homes avail of PPE if they are having problems getting supplies themselves privately? And Sorry, apologies, I thought you were finished. Um, secondly, we're, is, we're only taking one, Alex. Sorry, we're, we're only give every, I'll come back to you, but I will not get a chance to get back, but we're only taking one, hey, Jerry. Yeah, thanks. It follows on from, from Alex's point. I mean, we've heard a lot about lack of PPE um, uh, in regards to our home staff, and in previous um, reports I've heard about 
you know, before this crisis, um, car homes rationing and tea bags and adult nappies and so on and so forth. So, is there a concern that uh, equipment may be rationed, or is it the case that uh, car homes don't have enough? And if not enough is being provided uh, centrally, sure, surely that should be the case. So I, I can I can confirm that um, uh, the local trusts are working with their uh, home care providers to ensure. Uh, sufficient uh, supply and utilisation of, of PPE. I think that's an improving uh, position. Uh, there's now a single point of contact for all the care home staff. Uh, Tell us your uh, dog story, Rodney. Yeah, indeed. Um, uh, so they, they do say you should never work with children and dogs, don't they? Um, but um, my, my understanding is that there's a single point of contact uh, for the care home sector within each trust in order to support them around the PPE uh, issues. So I do think that that uh, is an improving position. I'm not suggesting for moment it's still not challenging, but it's definitely improving. Thank you. And finally, Alan. Yeah, I think we have to recognise that uh, the, the, the shortage of PPE isn't uniquely uh, a Northern Ireland problem, it's a worldwide problem. And indeed, that's uh, in your guidance. The uh, World Health Organisation do comment that industry would need to increase their capacity by 40% to meet the worldwide demand. Also in, in the guidance, it says that governments and health agencies across the world, including the UK, will need to find a balance between ensuring that frontline health care works are afforded the utmost protection to treat the public while also rationing supplies to ensure availability over the course of the pandemic. Uh, my question really is, are you closely monitoring and exercising care and where and how much uh, PPE uh, is being distributed? Uh, and do you have a system in place to respond quickly to establishments that are running dangerously low on supplies of uh, such equipment? So, uh, my understanding is that our uh, business service organisation do monitor the levels of stock uh, on, a, on a daily basis. But I also understand, uh, and I think someone alluded to it earlier on, that there is going to be an audit uh, of the utilisation of PPE uh, across our health social care system. Uh, and finally, um, if an organisation is running low, there are well defined mechanisms. To uh, ensure that that organisation gets uh, some stock as well as mutual aid, and by that I mean we work across health and social care organisations where one organisation is more stock than another, and it's needed uh, that we have a we have a system for sharing that. Thank you. And just a final one from me in relation to we're, we're picking up a lot of concerns about, and a lot of issues around different trusts having different guidance at different times. Is that an issue that PHA should we not be seeing consistent guidance being rolled out at the same time across all trusts? I would entirely agree uh, with you on that. Uh, there is, I believe that there is consistent guidance in the Public Health England PPE, and uh, more recently the department issued, for example, guidance on domiciliary care in relation to infection events control and PPE. Uh, so I do agree. Yeah, absolutely, consistent guidance across the entire system. Okay. Um, thank you very much to the panel for our, uh, our session this morning. I recognise it is a bit more difficult with the restrictions imposed by the, the need for physical distancing. I think on behalf of the committee, I'd like to wish you all well in your important work over the time ahead. Um, and to, uh, I'm sure it's something that the committee will be keeping an eye on in terms of the issues addressed today, and we will be keen to see some improvements across that range of issues. But thank you very much for your presentations this morning, and all the best for the time ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Members, I now propose that we'll take a short comfort break there and an opportunity to get in our next call in from our next set of presenters. So could we come back at 11.30, please? Thank you. Senate Chamber, programme signed. This okay, members, thank you for coming back. Um, and we are now going to uh, briefing in terms of COVID-19 disease response. We will now be having a briefing from the Royal Colleges on an anticipa anticipatory care planning and end of life conversations. Um, we all know this is a hugely sensitive area and, and an issue that we're all very much concerned about. And I think it's a very opportune time to hear from a, a range of experts in relation to 
the sensitivity and the difficulty of these, but also the very, very clear necessity at times to have these conversations and the benefit and value and worth of them um, in terms of providing families an opportunity to discuss their end-of-life cure wishes. Um, so I will advise members that representatives from the Royal College of GPs, together with colleagues from the Royal College of Surgeons and the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, are joining us by telephone conference to brief the Committee on Anticipatory Care Planning and End-of-Life Conversations During the Current Crisis. I refer members to the papers at tab 6 of the meeting pack and tab 5 of your table papers. Can I also refer members to hard copies of additional papers received from the Royal College of Surgeons after the table pack was issued. So we'd like to welcome this morning Dr Lawrence Dorman, Chair of the Royal College of GPs, Mr Mark Taylor, Director of the Royal College of Surgeons, Dr Hamish Courtney, Elected Council Member, Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, and Susan Kelly from the Royal College of Surgeons. So I'd like to welcome you all very, very much here to our meeting this morning, and thank you for taking time to address the committee. And I'd now invite you to brief the committee. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Dr Lawrence Dorman. I'm the Chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners, and I'm delighted to be joined here by my two esteemed hospital colleagues, Dr Hamish Courtney and Mr Mark Taylor. Uh, we are here together, the three of us here together, to, sh to show the committee that just as COVID-19 shows, shows no boundaries, we join together as one Lord, workforce. Lawrence can, you just, Lawrence, can you just hold a second? We're trying to get your volume up. We're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. No problem. So can you give that a try now, Lawrence, again? And, uh, here we go. Try, try it again. Can you hear me now? Still faint enough. We're getting you, but just about. If you could speak up a little louder. Okay. It's not going to be too much of an imposition, please. Sorry, you're okay. That's can, better. Can you, that's that better now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined here by my two esteemed hospital colleagues, uh, Dr. Courtney and Mr. Taylor. And we are here to show the committee that just as COVID-19 shows, shows no boundaries, we join together as one health force to serve our patients. Uh, the Royal College of GPs is a membership body of over 53,000 GPs in the UK, and in Northern Ireland, the Royal College of GPs NI represents over 1,400 GPs, around 80% of the workforce. Uh, we fully support Minister Swan, the Department of Health, and the CMO's efforts to manage the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as all of those involved in the national effort, and we wish to inform the, the committee on the important issue of advance or anticipatory care planning, or ACP for short. Isn't, sorry, can I just check there? The volume level's okay? Yeah, yeah it's just, yeah, it's, it's okay there. When you keep it at that there, it's fine. Better on, okay. So there are three key issues around ACP for the Royal College of GPs in Northern Ireland. The three key issues are, number one, advance care planning must be part of a national conversation. Number two, discussions around advance or anticipatory care planning are sensitive and they must ensure that the patient and their family are at its heart. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, known as CPR, is not a treatment on its own and when included in discussions, frequently becomes an unhelpful distraction. So we suggest that there should be no requirement for CPR discussion to be a mandatory part of ACP. It should only be raised if patients or the healthcare professional feel it will have benefit. And the third thing we feel is that ACP should be done not only just by GPs, but by the healthcare professional best known and trusted by their patient. So back in 2010, the Department of Health paper Living Matters, Dying Matters highlighted the need for families and the public to discuss end-of-life care. It talked about having a discussion of end-of-life care which should be promoted and encouraged through media education and awareness programs at the public and the health and social care sector. But the current COVID-19 pandemic has seen the importance of these discussions elevated. A patient with marked frailty, numerous medical conditions and general poor health will statistically be less likely to benefit from aggressive medical intervention and escalation of care. GPs and other health workers recognise their duty to have these conversations, but we urge the Department of Health to initiate the discussion at national level so it's not left to health professionals to discuss this cold calling, as it were. So our first urge 
is, number one, we urge the Department of Health to publicly encourage society and families to have the chat, to have the chat with other family members who were in frail and in poor health. For years, GPs in Northern Ireland have been having these sensitive and patient censored essential conversations with what is important to patients and their, what would their wishes be if their medical conditions worse. But during these times, potential scenarios have been different to our current crisis. Frequently, when patients have been advised of the various options alternative to hospital, patients have chosen to have their care provided in their own homes, supported by excellent care from GPs, community workers, district nurses, Macmillan and Marie Curie nurses. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has shown a different disease trajectory than the usual slow decline of frailty or cancer. Patients can often suddenly experience respiratory difficulties, and in such circumstances, these are not the ideal setting for important discussions to be had. It's much more desirable that a patient has had the opportunity before becoming acutely unwell to have a chat, and ACPs provide an individualized thinking ahead philosophy that significantly helps when difficult decisions are acquired. Access to good quality palliative medicine and personal care in these times are vital, and we urge families to concentrate on these issues which optimize quality of life in familiar environments rather than in hospital care settings uh, when visiting from families is currently restricted, and I appreciate this as a point at the moment. Lawrence, we're losing you there with volume. Oh, sorry. Yep. Yep. That's pattern again, eh? Better again, sorry. So we urge, we, we urge this as a national discussion. The second point is about the Royal College of GPs in Northern Ireland urges that the issue of resuscitation, often known as DNA CPR, to be omitted as obligatory from advanced care planning unless specifically requested by patients or professionals. Advanced care planning is about ensuring a person and their family are at the heart of difficult end-of-life conversations and what is important to them. Is my volume okay there, sir? Can... Yes, you're still okay. Sorry. The issue of advanced do not resuscitate order, sometimes known as DNA CPR, has been unhelpful in this process for a while. CPR is not, does not reverse underlying conditions and it will be successful if a patient has very advanced illnesses. The process of CPR has been glamorized, unfortunately, by Hollywood films, but patients who undergo CPR, they risk underusing palliative medicine the opportunity to spend days with family and loved ones. Unfortunately, CPR can be misinterpreted as refusing patients' treatments or access to basic care, and it has even been misinterrupted as, as rationing, but it is not. No other treatments or interventions are excluded by this decision, and some or all may be suitable, depending on an individual patient's circumstances. But COVID-19 raises new issues with CPR. All first responders in CPR are taught well to remove any danger to themselves and others when they arrive at a scene. And resuscitation guidelines make, encourage us to make sure that, that the first responder and the victim and the bystanders are all safe. But current resuscitation guidelines encourage us to use full donning of PPE because this is deemed a risky aerosol generating procedure and this would include putting on a gown and a specialist respirator mask which takes minutes to don therefore reducing the, the likelihood of success. A joint statement from the Royal College of GPs, uh, the BMA and the CQC suggests that it's, it's inappropriate to apply these decisions to any group of people and these need to be done on an individual basis and we fully support this and are keen to promote these decisions not need to be done to any group, particularly people feeling that they're just being marginalised because they're elderly or so on. This needs to be done on an individual basis. Your, your volume is dropped again, Lawrence. Sorry, sorry. Here we go. But we are encouraging that during this crisis that there is no mandatory requirement to discuss CPR unless a patient initiates it. And then the final part is that we feel that ACPs Number three, ACP should be performed by a wide range of health professionals and not just GPs. We believe that the clinician or the, the healthcare worker who knows the patient best should be able to perform this with the patient and their family. Uh, this may include 
I mean, GPs, and the bulk of this will fall to GPs, but patients may well know my colleagues, Dr. Courtney or Mr. Taylor, better than they know me, and so these decisions must be done by the, the health professional who knows the patient best. Currently, between primary and secondary care, there can be difficult, difficulty communicating this, and we urge all electronic methods to ensure that these important wishes are easily recorded and transferable from hospital through to community. The Royal College of GPs has clear advice about advanced care planning, and we feel that it is very important that these establish and respect the autonomous preferences of patients who are often vulnerable. And, and they must get the type of care that they would like to receive and in case they get infected with COVID or a serious or life-threatening illness. But hospital physicians like Dr. Courtney, surgeons like Mr. Taylor, and GPs like myself, we have all dedicated our professional working lives to advocate for our patients. We will not advise them on a treatment or path that we do not feel is in their best interests. And we will always strive to offer them the highest standards of care available. But in difficult circumstances, such as COVID-19, good personal care with access to palliative support is frequently best for our patients. Advanced care planning is not a one-off discussion, but it should be an ongoing discussion with the patient and their family, and this can change according to a patient's clinical condition and personal circumstances. This discussion should not be limited to the COVID crisis, but constitutes good medicine and must be recognised as best practice by all doctors. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Lawrence, and, um, and, and other members of the panel. And I suppose we are... We are all very conscious of concerns having been raised at this time where these conversations have been had and we recognise I think that, that there are times when that's appropriate but there have been reports at times where the conversation has been had in a way that, that has made families or patients feel under pressure that they're being pressurised to accept this. What would your view be in terms of communicating and having those discussions? How should that be done and how can we address the issue where people feel they're being put under pressure? to accept something that they do not really want to consider. I, I fully agree with that, Chair, and it's very important these, these are done right, so they are, and that's why we urge it, particularly as a national level, so that this doesn't come as a shock, so that families can gradually start to introduce these discussions and, and, and discuss with their family what is important to them. Uh, we, 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 we do not recommend that these are done on a blanket way. They must not uh, discriminate or marginalise any particular type of patient. They must be done on an individual basis and on a compassionate basis. Okay, thank uh, you. Uh, yeah. I wonder if, uh, sorry, Chair, I wonder if I could come in, if Ham Dr. Hamish Courtney from the College of Physicians. Yes, Dr. Hamish, hey, go ahead. Uh, uh, I'm coming from a very different perspective than Dr. Dorman, because um, as hospital doctors, we sort of witness the effect daily of people who haven't had the opportunity to previously consider their own end of life. And, and this is not just about COVID, although COVID has brought this into sharp focus, and it's not about rationing. It's about us as society, about doctors with their patients, about families, about individuals discussing their end of life. And it's about providing compassionate care, allows people to die peaceful and dignified deaths, if that's possible. Uh, but most of us... I think when we're asked, would choose, if possible, not to die in hospital. Most of us would choose, if possible, not to have tubes and catheters and lines going into us. And we'd rather, rather than be surrounded by machines, I think most of us would prefer to be surrounded by those we love. And yet, in the hospital setting, we know that, un unless we know otherwise, in the emergency room, we have to institute many of these interventions, and the chance for a peaceful death is greatly reduced. And we see this day and daily in hospital in the non-COVID context. People with advancing irreversible diseases where the end of life might be anticipated in the not too distant future are brought to hospital by, for very well-meaning and loving reasons, but this results in the medicalizing of the whole process of dying. And so from the hospital physician point of view, we recognize advanced care planning in the community before the emergency room to be the marker of good clinical care, to respect the dignity of the human being, and to value not only a good life, but a, a good death. And so we really support uh, the Royal College of GPs in their efforts to have the conversation early, before the emergency comes, when these decisions are very difficult and all sorts of other issues are present, making 
making the conversation all the more difficult. So uh, people don't feel the same pressure if it's brought uh, in a very measured way by a respected GP, for example, who knows the family, knows the patient, and can discuss this in a in in a much uh, a much more settled environment. Uh, Thanks, Chair. Yep. Mark Taylor, if you don't mind, I'll follow. Uh, I agree with the sentiments of both um, uh, Hamish and Lawrence. Um, uh, we are standing uh, together on this really important issue, but has been rehearsed an issue which we're all um, dealing with each and every day of our clinical practice, maybe in slightly different uh, jurisdictions in my own with the, the sequelae of cancer and advanced cancer patients having the discussion. Uh, I think one point of clarity is that the advanced care planning uh, is, a, is a national situation. It's that discussion that takes place about what one's end of life would look like. I hope we don't mix that up with some of the clinical decision making which has to be made in the very ill patient within the hospital environment around the use of artificial ventilation, etc. because those are clinical decisions that are reached with the family based on many aspects of that person's health and the likelihood that they would survive and, and recover um, from uh, major interventional treatment. So the advanced care planning is very much a, a discussion with all as to what the end of life uh, would be like for you. What would you prefer, as Hamish has articulated? Uh, but there are obviously decisions within hospital that are made in the feeling patient with the family, with the patient. And I hear you, Chair, saying about that better communication. I think we all strive for that better communication in those extremely difficult times for all. Just a small point from Paula in relation to your remarks. Yeah, Mark. thank you. I just wanted to come straight in on that. I received a very upsetting email this morning from a constituent whose husband is in hospital. He was told by his doctor one morning this week that they wouldn't be taking him down to ICU if he had a turn for the worse. This constituent didn't understand what that meant. And she asked him, do you know what this means? And when it dawned on him, he started to cry. She said she was trying not to cry. She says it seemed, sorry, I'm nearly crying now. She said it was so callous and cold and devoid of any humanity. So there may be good guidance and there may be good intention, but the practice may be at the minute around communicating those clinical decisions. There are gaps there. So I would like you to respond to that. I, I can respond certainly from the hospital physician point of view, and I, I, I fully um, appreciate the, the sentiment and how, how difficult that can be. This is clearly needs to be handled in an extremely sensitive way, um, and it's uh, it's not a, a decision that's foisted on people. I think the guidance would be that it's very much a discussion between families, between patients, and between uh, healthcare staff, and so rather than people suddenly been told this is what's happening. It's a, a discussion that's very much encouraged uh, to come to some consensus as to what the future care would be. Um, and so we really want to, to encourage that um, in hospital care. I'll just make a very quick very brief point. Very quick. It was only then when the wife made a complaint that they then said that they were revoking the DNR. I mean, that really is poor practice. Thank you. I think that message does need to go out. It's absolutely unacceptable that families or anyone would feel under pressure in relation to this issue, and I think that message needs to go out urgently. Uh, Chair, if I could come in, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I, I, I hear um, exactly uh, what... Pa can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. I, I hear exactly what Paula is saying, and actually, obviously, without uh, going into individual cases, we are all sons, daughters mums, dads uh, and family members and I suppose that that old saying treat your patients as if you would want them to be treating your mother or father and that, you know as Amy said this, this, is, this is a very difficult period of time and actually um, many of us in our uh, roles as trainers um, spend um, endless hours teaching our juniors about the art of communication and very much within that communication is how you talk 
to someone um, who is failing in medical therapy or how you address the situation of a loved one going on to a ventilator that very sadly they never come off. And, and it's having that very difficult discussion. I don't know the circumstances of the case you're um, exp uh, discussing. I know the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine have produced quite a bit of guidance around making those really difficult decisions around those people who would recover, who will recover from the severity of their illness. Um, but the one statement that goes through that is it has to be in joint discussion with the person themselves, if they're able and cognizant to have that discussion, but also the family. Okay, thank you. I'm going to now go to uh, members, and I'll start there with uh, Pam Cameron. Pam, are you there? Yes, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you all for your presentation. I think it's really uh, vitally important that we have heard this presentation from um, you as professionals in the field, and uh, just uh, to make a comment on uh, the last commentator there on the art of communication. I think it was vitally important, obviously. And we all have different skills, regardless of our qualifications and in this life. And some people are better than others at communicating. I think we need to realise that. And I think it's um, really fantastic that we're, we're now having this conversation, which needs to be had on a national level in regard to advanced care planning. I think that is absolutely vital. And I think we as politicians can do our bit in trying to raise awareness around the issue to help uh, you as a professional to continue to do the good job that you are doing. Um, in terms of uh, GPs in particular, uh, can you tell me how many um, ACPs have been completed by GP practices and how many of these have included decisions on um, CPR or DNR and have GPs received complaints about ACP since the outbreak started? And uh, my second question would be on care homes, um, and that would be um, in terms of are those in residential care treated, how, how are they treated in respect of these conversations, and are most of the plans pre-existing? Thank you. Uh, panel, please. Thank you for your question there, Paula. Uh, I'm unable to give you the exact number of advanced care plans, uh, but it is something that we encourage our members, you know, to, and it's something that GPs recognise that, that that needs to be done, with, you know, particularly for our frailest, frailest patients. Un unfortunately, at the moment, I would anticipate that the majority of these patients will have a, a DNA CPR attached as part of that discussion. It has become part of the discussion nearly as a prerequisite, and that is why we're urging for it, because it's become misinterpreted as treatment, so it is. CPR is not a treatment. It, it is a process that happens when somebody's heart stops. And it is very important that once it is mentioned, it, it dominates the entire discussion. And so what we are encouraging is there are more sensitive things that we need to be discussing first before we come to the DNA CPR. It, it is starting to um, just be the only thing that is discussed. So things that, that we would encourage is what is the patient's understanding of their diagnosis? What things matter to them? And we can, we can go through uh, scenarios with them. So it's very important. The other thing about care homes, and again, we, we're very keen about care homes. Uh, and I mean, our, our own chair has, has uh, I mean, issued as a, a statement about care homes uh, on the 6th of April, and he says, I mean, that we have to treat patients in care homes, you know, like 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 we should. That we must give them all the, the GP care that they need. And so we are still in regular contact with our care home staff. We are still providing care for them, and if they are. Uh, symptoms of COVID and they, they need visits. We now have our COVID centres which are able to perform visits for these patients. But it's important that they are treated as individuals, they are treated with compassion and care. Okay, thank you. And Lawrence, we're, throughout, as you, as you speak, we, we tend to lose your volume. So if you can just try to maintain that volume throughout, it's, we're losing you towards the end at some times, but I think we've just about caught that. Um, uh, going now then, and could I remind members that we're only going to have time for one question each during this section, so could I remind members please, and, and to give everyone towards the end a chance, please keep it as succinct as possible in terms of question and answer. So I'm coming now to Pat Sheehan. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, would it be in, in order to ask Mark a question on the clinical gate, the surgical prioritisation at this moment in time, given that he's going to have to leave by 10 past yeah. 12? Yeah, whatever, whatever your question is, Pat, go ahead. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, uh, thanks, Mark, for your presentation there. And I'm just wondering, in terms of prioritisation, how do you hope to achieve that? Um, how are you going to prioritise the patients that need surgery? And what are the risks involved in this? Thank you. Yeah, Mark? Pat, thank you very much for the question. And it's actually a really important question, I suppose, to put it into the context. First of all, could I pay a massive tribute to the people of uh, this part of, of Ireland, of Northern Ireland, because they've done a fantastic job of social isolation to allow us to manage the COVID crisis at present, to allow us to manage it without seeing the scenes from Italy and Spain. Uh, and I pay tribute to our nurses, domestics, porters, uh, all on the front line. Now is the time, uh, as we reach the peak, now is the time to consider how do we deal with the non-COVID patients, and particularly your question, Pat, relates to surgery. So we have got to start thinking now about how we bring patients in for surgery. We are cognizant that in doing so, there is risk, the risk, obviously, of um, exposing vulnerable people to the potential for a COVID infection. Um, there's also the risk around um, uh, healthcare workers themselves being affected by an infected patient. But clearly, we, we have to start looking at our college guidance on uh, surgical prioritisation, I hope is in your packs, and apologies for the late arrival, um, sets out really what the priority should be, both time-dependent priorities and also each surgical specialty priority. So what cases in each type of surgery need to be done irrespective of where we sit in the coronavirus pandemic? And actually, what surgical procedures can be waited upon, can be left until we see this surge pass? So that, that guidance is, is available. But I suppose in terms of the strategy to that, I think we have got to reflect on some of the areas of really best practice that have come about as a result of this COVID-19. We are now doing virtual clinics, telephone and virtual clinics, very similar to what we're doing at this very important um, health committee meeting. We are actually looking at, we, this has to stay, many aspects of this has to stay as we go forward in terms of prioritizing our patients for surgery. So it's pausing, reflecting on that best practice, and then just getting on with isolating COVID clean as far as possible areas of bringing those people in, patients that are waiting for that, that time-dependent surgery, checking their COVID negative clearly, and bringing them in and getting on with their surgery in that safe, calm environment. At the minute, there is no doubt. I'm sure Chair and everyone will appreciate that. It's actually very, very difficult. OK, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead then to Orlea. And we'll take a single question now. And if we get an opportunity, maybe we can extend a wee bit if the, panel, if the panel's time allows. But we'll take an in a single question now, and we may get back with a few more. So I'll go now to Orlea. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm just conscious, you know, the, when, on this issue around the end of life conversations, um, it's obviously really difficult and traumatic um, for patients, for their families, but of course for our health and social care staff as well. Um, and I would like to ask the, the panel, um, I had read in one of the briefing notes around the, um, the debriefing sessions and the available resources, there was like a link to wellbeing training. Um, but I just wanted to ask, outside of that, that link, um, what mental health provision and support are we putting in place for our health and social care staff? I know that some of the trusts in previous briefings that we've had have said that in the hospital setting, some of them are setting up, you know, uh, mental health teams made up of um, psychiatrists to, to try and help the staff and the doctors and the nurses in the hospitals. Is that similar um, support in place for GPs? And also, what communication has been received or has any arrangements been put in place 
on the back of the announcement in Britain last week around the mental health helpline number for all of our NHS staff. And thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you, Arlea. Thanks, Arlea. I'll take this, Hamish Courtney. I'll take us first from the hospital point of view. Um, we recognise that this whole COVID crisis has put a huge, a huge strain on all aspects of the, of the hospital staff, uh, doctors, nurses, physios, domestics, every, everyone. Um, uh, this huge upheaval is having an effect on people. People are anxious about getting COVID themselves. People's whole working patterns have been disrupted, and this will continue and will need to be uh, a real focus going forward as to how we address the psychological impact of, of COVID on our, on our staff. And so the trusts have, as you've indicated, already started preparing that journey, and there are uh, mental health well-being resources that are available in every trust. Um, there are national resources that are available. We're being signposted to them regularly. There are um, innovative things that are happening in trusts. Um, and there's things that we do just as teams together, debriefing, talking, um, talking over lunch, uh, looking out for each other, all those things that we do, I think, um, and we need to do more and more of um, as going, going forward in this. So resources are available, resources are going to be needed, and it's a really important part moving forward as we, as we exit from this whole, whole uh, COVID emergency. Thank you. Um, now, uh, going to Colin McGrath. Colin, are you there? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, um, I, along with my family, had uh, the humbling and privileged experience of nursing my father to death at home. But at this time, many people, because of COVID, whether they have coronavirus or not, um, many families are not able to access their loved ones whenever they are um, their health is deteriorating and unfortunately are passing away. Now, I know that in England um, it was said yesterday that they will make moves to change that um, and I've written to the health minister but I was just wondering if we could get the panel's thoughts on whether it would be a difficult scenario when somebody is terminally ill in a health setting very, very close to their death. Is there methods that we could allow family members to be with them with the appropriate PPE to share those very, very important last moments with their, their loved one. Thank you, Colin. Yeah, it's Hamish Courtney here again. Uh, clearly this has been in the media over the last couple of days and is a hugely, hugely important issue. It's not about infection control simply. It's about uh, humanity and understanding um, families and our life and how our lives must end and uh, just basic humanity um, of having one's loved ones around one, one one's life is coming to an end. Um, so there's been discussion in England. The Scottish Academy yesterday produced a document that uh, includes very practical advice regarding this. So guidelines about allowing relatives to be with loved ones, um, advice about personal protection equipment for them, etc. Um, so there's very practical advice that has now become available in the last few days, and I would urge that the Northern Ireland Department of Health um, adopt similar guidelines. Um, I know that already in the trusts um, there have been um, facilities made for relatives to, to attend, but I think this could uh, reduce a lot of anxiety if, if there were more formal, um, uh, formal guidance available from the hospital point of view. Perhaps Lawrence wants to comment on the, on the uh, care home or community. So, so again, I mean, the PPE is, is there for people's protection and to keep them safe. And and in the community, it's it's quite tricky. But our, our district nurses and still are still going in and providing support, uh, as are our GPs. But again, we are still trying to minimise the footfall. But we are still trying to do this as safely as possible, uh, and as same says, with as much humanity and care and compassion as we can. And if I could come in, I think it's a very good question, Colin, and I think that. We, um, in our roles as, as clinical leaders or uh, on the wards, we should make every possible um, uh, uh, resource to actually look at that in the sense of moving 
the patient into a, a side room, um, gowning the family, maybe a small number of the family to be there under instruction, um, um, having a nurse um, guiding them through the, the process and obviously weighing up the risks of, of contamination to themselves or staff, but, but, but also the, 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 the ability to be with one's loved one uh, as they pass. I think, um, you know, as, as we have said before, we're, we're advocates for our patients and that, that includes in their final moments of life. So I'm sure we, we could urge the department to produce guidance for us all in that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Paula? Thank you. Thank you. Um, as, as the Assembly got back up and running, we as a committee started looking at the whole health transformation agenda and the, the pressures like waiting lists. So the question is really about coming out of this pandemic and how and when do you see a return to providing elective care in, the, in our hospitals as opposed to independent settings? Thanks. Um, so, Paula, I'm very... Um, Sorry, we lost you there. I think that was Mark. Mark, I think we lost yeah, you, Mark. Yeah, sorry. You still there? Just speak oh, up a little, sorry. Mark. You've got a bit yeah. faint there as well. Sorry. It's normally the sorry. doctors lecture on many other things, but this time I'm feeling I'm having to. I'm having, if you all keep keep the phone up very close and speak a little louder, please. Sorry, my apologies, yeah. Chair. Uh, Paula, a very, very important question and actually one that causes me um, great anxiety. Obviously, before COVID, we were all very aware of the waiting lists and clearly the COVID situation is going to make those waiting lists even worse. Um, and the, the decision around when we start the plan has already started and it's actually something that, that I would encourage all of us together and I pay tribute to the committee for um, um, bringing this up and prompting uh, uh, the situation. Um, my apologies for the phone. Uh, prompting the situation. Um, clearly, we would um, would look to increasing capacity. Uh, and one example may well be the the use of those private facilities that were taken over at COVID. Whether there was extension of that um, after the peak to allow ongoing elective surgical practice to continue um, for the benefit of the NHS. Um, looking at doing things in a completely different way. We've highlighted already some of the major changes that have happened in the space of a small uh, number of weeks for necessity. And we are um, very much more around virtual reality, but actually fast tracking. And many of the things we did in the past, historically, um, by necessity, we can't do anymore. So we need to bring those forward with us and drive forward the, um, the elective care. But it's also going to come back to a word that um, you're all familiar with, and that is money that we will need to have sustained investment to address this backlog, which sadly is going to be much worse now. Perhaps I could come in there from the physician's point of view. Yep. Uh, we physicians represent all the medical specialties in the hospital, um, and we are concerned that the longer we um, delay um, looking after all the bread and butter non-COVID pathology that we look after, that the more problems we're pushing back for the future. So we're very keen that as soon as it's safe and practical, that we return in a phased way to seeing our patients with all their neurology, cardiology, gastroenterology, and all the other specialties that we look after. Um, so it, uh, we, we're keen that, that that starts now and we plan for a phased return of this as soon as possible. We clearly need to, re to reassure the public. I think people are very scared to come to hospital for good reason. And we need to reassure the public and there needs to be social distancing, there needs to be the use of clean sites, there needs to be uh, thoughtful ways of encouraging people to come back to hospital for management of the conditions that they need need specialist care for, but it needs to be uh, sooner rather than later, so we don't have a, a, a surge of non-COVID problems in the future. And, and can I come in from a general practice point of view too, please, Chair? Yes, uh, I mean, uh, so g general practice is very much open for business at this time, and our message to our patients is loud and clear that if you, particularly if you have a child who's unwell, please ring us, please talk to us. Uh, we see essential services like childhood vaccination.
extremely important and we're keen to keep these services going. Uh, but like Hamish and Marcus said, I mean, our college produced a statement on the 9th of April that says, I mean, that there's a risk of serious consequences if non-COVID conditions are unmanaged or untreated. And for things from our point of view, it's things like cancers, cancers being diagnosed that Mark can operate on if we leave them too long or if conditions like diabetes that Hamish has to manage if we leave these too long as well, that the risk of the complications and have you know, much more expensive consequences to patients' health further on down the line. So we do need to have to, have to make action. Chair, do you mind if I leave the committee? I'm very, very sorry. Okay, listen, thank you very much. And we understand that you, that you were in that, but that's Mark, isn't it? Yeah? Yes. Yes, Mark, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, I, I think in relation to that section, it's, it's, it's critical that we acknowledge that we were in such a worse position in terms of the waiting list before this started, that we are going to be disproportionately and are being disproportionately impacted by that issue. So I think it, that is very important that we, that we get to grips with that. And I also would like to reiterate the message around children, those with strokes, those with heart conditions, that they seek the medical assistance that they, that they normally would, that they, that they do not be disinhibited from, from contacting and, and looking after or, or making contact with medical services. Um, moving on now to Alex, please. Yeah, um, can I go back to DNRs? Yeah. Um, I, I raised this last week and um, Paula's mentioned her experience. Um, and I think since then I, I actually got quite a, a nasty response from a member of the medical world who accused me of not knowing what I was talking about and uh, it was actually quite disappointing. But I have to say we have to represent people who come to us and families and I think it's purple I think it's proper that we raise that issue um, with you um, that uh, we discuss this in a respectful and, and calm way, and, and it's a very important issue. Um, and I think my question to you is, you know, patient or the client does need to have that conversation where possible, and indeed the families, and the family's decision and the patient needs to be respected in whatever decision that they make. Um, and the, there must never be a, a hierarchy of individuals involved in this, so the families must be consulted in every case uh, possible. Um, and certainly I, I got a, a further email from a, another family who were not consulted, um, and uh, it's very, very distressing. So there needs to be uh, something in place that families are always given the opportunity to give their view and um, the patient or the resident has has that chance as well if possible so um, something needs to to be done that 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 is ensured and it protects health staff as well I think okay thank you for that Alex. I, mean, I, I agree with a lot of your points and, and one of the big reasons that we're keen to discuss this issue today is so that families get get good uh, advice and guidance about about DNA CPR, and and my issue, uh, tying it into advanced care planning, is that the DNAR is actually a small part of the whole discussion around advanced or ancillary care planning. Uh, there's so much more to that discussion that should be happening, but once the DNAR gets mentioned. It, it dominates the discussion and it's r quite right that this has to be a discussion done with care and compassion with a family and an individual and you're quite right it has been done very badly in other parts of the UK and we're, we're very keen that it's done right here so it's done by a health professional. We're, we're losing you Lawrence there, can you speak up a little again? Oh sorry, yep. here we go. So it's really important that this is done by a health professional who cares and a health professional who can convey that with good communication skills and we certainly take on board the, the necessity for that uh, and we, we want, the, these things have to be done right, so they do, but it's really important that the, the realities of, of DNAR doesn't overshadow the advanced care plan uh, and, uh, and that the, it doesn't preclude treatment. So. People are mistaking what treatment involves. So, treat, so somebody with a DNA CPR can have full treatment. They can have antibiotics. They can have 
things that will help keep them more comfortable and so on. It doesn't it doesn't withdraw treatment, and that's why we're we're concerned that it's dominating the discussions. But you're quite right; it needs to be done sensitively and for an individual basis. Yeah, and I, I, I um, think. Yeah, go ahead. Were you going to come in there, Hamish? Sorry, yes, I was going to come in from the hospital point of view, where we have these discussions every day, and I, I think it is worth saying uh, that that CPR. I'm trying to understand what it is. It really is just to trying to restart a heart that has stopped, and it doesn't work for frail, sick people, and it doesn't reverse underlying conditions. Um, it has very little prospect of success in many cases, and a very high chance of harm in many cases. It's invasive and it's unpleasant, um, and it often doesn't allow a dignified, peaceful death to occur. Um, and so, we need to think about about it as allowing and permitting a dignified death to have a DNA CPR in place. But you're very, you're right, completely right. It is a discussion that needs to be had with the, taking into account the benefits, the risks, the burdens of CPR, taking into account the patient's wishes, their preferences, the views of the healthcare team and the views where appropriate of the whole family. Um, I, I would, wouldn't want families to feel that they have to make the decision. They're not being asked to make a decision whether CPR happens or not. They're being asked for their views, um, particularly what they think the views of the person, the patient is, if they uh, don't have capacity to make that decision. Um, and so it's taking that whole thing in the round. But you're right, communication is really vital and uh, really a fundamental part of good clinical practice. Yeah, and I, th I think there is additional pressure at this time. I think I think it's it's widely recognised there is an additional anxiety, or even as far as fear element with COVID nineteen. Not only the scale of it, but the impact of it on individuals, the impact on the end of life communications with families. So I suppose we all recognise that all health professionals are out there on the front line doing their very best. But I suppose it would be good if that can be recognised as well that there's a. An, this has always been a sensitive issue and a difficult issue. There's additional sensitivities around it at this time, and I suppose it's a question of trying to have the conversations as early as possible, and with with the people who who families know best, as you have, as, as as you have both pointed out. Um, I will maybe. Do you have time to do another quick round of questions, or how is? Oh, sorry, I have Jerry. Sorry, I, I missed out Jerry there. Thanks, Go ahead, Jerry. Jerry. Uh, I mean, obviously, hearing the reports last week and, and Paul's today, if, if people are being pressured into um, saying uh, DNRs or, or the enforcement, that's that's quite concerning. Um, and maybe a follow on from sort of Paula's suggestion that the family kind of got a, a change of uh, decision really um, after pressure. Um, I think there needs to be a bit of work in terms of issuing the guidance uh, to to the public. Um, I would just like to ask the panel. Um, would you be confident that this time the decisions, and a lot of them are quick decisions, uh, decisions made under pressure, but decisions won't be made that are out of kilter with the uh, wishes of the patient or their families? So, so can I answer from that? So from a community point of view, I'm, I'm very confident these are having these discussions. They're having them on an individual basis with patients they know very well, and frequently the GPs will have known them for years. So I am confident that they are acting in their patient's advocate. That's one of the GP's job is to, is to advocate for what is best for a patient. And, and I, as a GP, will only uh, pursue things that I think are beneficial and good for my patient. Uh, it is not, like I said, the DNA CPR is only for, for the resuscitation, but it's not for treatment. Uh, so things like if somebody fractures their hip, there is still a, a quite, you know, quite a legitimate argument that they can have operations and it's not taking away treatment. It's just in this very end situation when somebody's heart stops. So no, nothing will be denied to people and it will always be discussed and it will always be discussed in a compassionate manner, but always take into account what is best for that person. Thank you. And Alan? Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> Chair, on a, on a personal level, I, I, I couldn't start to identify with uh, dealing with this emotive type of uh, decision making and, and understand and, and that once that decision is made, uh, and not to give CPR, etc., it doesn't afford a second chance. So we're in a unique uh, situation, and it's an issue that could easily become uh, a box ticking bureaucrat bureaucratic exercise. So I've just, it's m more a comment than a question, I've just asked the uh, the medical staff to please continue to concentrate on passionate uh, patient and family consultation. And I do recognise on a, a personal level as well, where a close relative died from a heart failure, 
and the medical staff had to come and talk to the family about uh, CPR, and they'd already performed it twice. And I recognise it's not a pleasant experience either for the medical staff to have to conduct that at the end of life. Okay. Well, I'm really sorry for your loss, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, and that those are very brave decisions. So they are. It, it's very important to realise as well that an advanced care plan should be part of a, an ongoing discussion. This isn't something that just you, you get labelled with this and that's the end of the story. I mean, as doctors, of course, we hope people's conditions change, and of course, we hope people's conditions improve. So these are part of an ongoing discussion. It can be revised both up and down. So. It's very important to realise that, that even though a discussion happens, there's still the benefit of coming back and, and more discussions happening, and particularly whenever we have GPs. Uh, and like I say, we are our patients, you know, advocate in the community, right from cradle to grave, giving cradle to grave care. These discussions can come back again. Patients can come back and talk to us about things that have happened before, and we can review these. But it needs to be part of a national conversation so that we're not seen to be doing this suddenly and in a time of crisis. And I think that's very important for the Department of Health to, to start this as a national discussion where we talk about it together. And I'd like just to emphasise from the hospital point of view and to reassure both the committee and the public that people are reviewed on a daily basis, decisions are reviewed on a daily basis, discussed on a daily basis, and uh, that one people are just labelled with something and then left. It's, a, it's an ongoing continual review, continual assessment, and uh, not a one-off decision that are made. Yeah, and I think, it's, I think it's crucial in relation to that that it's made clear to people that if they, if they arrive at a decision today that there's nothing to stop them changing their mind and, and reversing that decision, that the Absolutely. decision must always rest with them and be reviewable. Um, can I also ask on another issue that has come up here, and I have attended events here in the, in the Long Gallery, around the issue of uh, where people have been fitted with maybe um, pacemakers and, and devices like that. And I know there have been issues around guidance as to when those would be uh, switched off, and, and at the end of life those can become quite invasive, in a sense. Is there guidance or is there, is there, a, is there a concern that that is still an, unre an unresolved issue? No, there's clear guidance, and our cardiology colleagues um, are well experienced in, in managing that. So there's clear guidance about uh, your right switching off, switching down devices so they don't um, fire inappropriately at end of life stage. It's a really important point, um, and, and there's clear guidance surrounding it and, and, and good practice surrounding it. And can I come in as well there, please, Chair? Yeah. So, so CPR, we are not, we're advocating CPR for, for unexpected cardiac events. So the, when we've been talking about ACP, this is for frail people who are very un, unwell, but CPR is vital, and it, we would still encourage the public to have you know, good training on CPR for people who, who suffer heart attacks and things like that. Uh, Hamish is quite right. There is good guidelines about turning off fitted pacemakers, but as we know, legislation has changed in the certification of patients who have died who are for cremation. And now, in the community, it only needs one doctor to sign the form. So I would still urge GPs who are doing these forms to check for fitted pacemakers, which could be at risk, a risk to our crematorium colleagues, so it's just to make sure that they, that they have documented whether those are present or not. OK, thank you. Can I just check with both of you there? Are you OK for another, say, maybe 10 minutes or so, if, if members want a few additional questions? Yes, yes. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go around in the same order just, just for convenience, but if members don't have a question, that, that's also fine. We have covered quite a bit of ground, but I'll do a quick, a quick run around then again. So, Pam, are you there with us? I am, yes, Chair. Um, I just want to not ask a question, but just say thank you to each and every one of you for uh, your contribution today. I think it's absolutely vital that, that we, we take this session and actually uh, use it to the best of our ability to try and get the word out there, um, out, uh, just as we do in terms of organ donation. It's, it's really important that we have those conversations. And uh, I would appeal to you to let us know if there's anything at all that you think we can do as members, individual members or the committee, to help you to encourage those conversations. But I want to thank you for your professionalism and for your attendance today. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, Pat? Uh, thank you, Chair. And likewise, I just want to make a comment. I mean, I suppose the whole issue around advanced care planning and DNRs and, and, and so forth, 
or something that should take place in, in a context of, of us not being in an emergency or a crisis. Uh, and I suppose some of the uh, commentary in, in the early stages of this um, around herd immunity and so on, and the beliefs that some people effectively were going to be uh, at the bottom of a packing order has increased concern, particularly uh, around the the elderly and the and the vulnerable, that that they were going to be left to their own devices and so on. And uh, you know, um, I suppose a certain cynicism has come into discussions that have taken place around uh, end of life care and planning and so on. Uh, so I, I concur with whoever it was who said there earlier. I think it might have been Lawrence who said that uh, the department needs to initiate a conversation around uh, advanced care planning uh, and end of life care and, and so on. So uh, thanks, all of you, for your contributions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Orlea? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to repeat um, Tom's sentiments. Just thanks very much for everything that you are doing. Um, and any support that we can give you as a committee, um, we're here. Um, I just wanted to maybe ask one quick question or just to get your views on to bring it back to the issue we covered in the previous session around um, testing and contact tracing. Um, are, are you confident you know, within, within your work environment, within the hospital settings, within the GP surgeries, um, that the system that has been put in place for the testing with the drive-through testing centres, are you confident that your staff um, are being tested in a timely um, manner at present? Thank you, Arlene. Okay, so, thank you, Arlene. Go ahead, Lawrence. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. So, so from a general practice point of view, thank you very much, Arlene. Yes, we are getting tested and we have access to testing now, which is great. Uh, it's done actually through our own GPs. So if you imagine I as a, as a person have my own GP, so it is done through that, which is very important because there has to be governance with that, but it goes into my health records. So we now have a good system of general practice where we are being tested, uh, and that's very important. Uh, our own college has been very, uh, nationally has been, has been very uh, encouraged by testing in care homes, uh, particularly with patients who are showing symptoms, and when we have a publication out on the 15th of April that we support this whenever uh, people are showing symptoms in care homes, and we're quite pleased with the, the announcements during this week. And from the hospital point of view, testing is in a, a much different place than it was a few weeks ago, so there's been a huge effort has been put in by government, which we appreciate, and uh, testing has, has improved considerably. Um, in terms of contact tracing, I think it's going to be a whole different discussion as we move out of this um, and how we move exit out of, out of the current crisis. Um, and that's a whole different uh, level of discussion about, the, about how we do contact tracing and should we. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Colin? Yes, thank you. Just, um, this is a question more out of individual curiosity rather than any specific case that's been mentioned to me. But there have been substantial changes to the verification and certification of deaths. Um, I'm just wondering that certainly if we were to look at the maybe a care home or nursing home sector where they receive excellent care, but there were lots of checks and balances that were in place uh, that there was a medical practitioner that would have verified a doctor that was a, would have been attending at some point in the previous number of days would definitely have been the one that would have certified this. Um, if there was any cause for concern, it could have moved to the coroner and there could have been some form of autopsy. But all those checks and balances have been removed from the system as a result of COVID. And just in a general way, are, are you confident that the situation is robust enough? So, so that's an excellent question, Colin, and you're right. We're, we, we've had some legislation there that's come in very quickly, uh, and it has quite significant implications, particularly the, uh, the certificate, certification of patients by just one doctor for cremation. Uh, we're keen that these things are all reviewed at the end of COVID, for, you know, and that, that uh, whenever we have the benefit of time, that we can, we can look better. There are, like with all these things, 
things that will work for the better. So at the moment, I mean, the online reporting of deaths, I think, can be a, an excellent thing and a much more timely and efficient way of, of doing mm-hmm. things. And also, the number of people who are qualified or deemed competent to pronounce life extinct can be a really helpful thing. And again, we're hoping that some of this learning comes through from this, because again, that, that helps it helps families in difficult situations and it helps it just helps everything it helps make the whole process much more efficient and better for everybody thank you um paula fine thank you yeah thanks paula uh alex yeah jerry yeah, just I mean a general question, uh, just a, an issue that just occurred to me after the discussion. I mean, is, is there an argument for care plans to be updated and uh, advanced care plans to be updated? Because I, I would guess most of them were um, uh, formulated before the the coronavirus uh, developed. Yeah, and, and that's and that's a good question. And again, we, we do recommend that they're always updated, so they are. So normally, in general practice, the very last question or the very last thing that we have to fill out is, you know, data review, whether it's going to be six months or a year. So, so we encourage these to be done, updated and reviewed very frequently. Uh, it'll be good with modern technology if we can work out of ways that that they can be done electronically and that these electronic records are seamlessly transferred to the likes of Hamish and so on, so that if he and I are doing these discussions, they flow seamlessly between primary and secondary care. Can I just ask, sorry, it's hard to hear you at the end there. Um, I think, oh, you, I think so, you said it's six months normally. Yeah, so, so, there... so, 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 you know, whenever we, whenever we do these in primary care, there's an automatic thing at the bottom usually where we say, you know, when they need to be reviewed. And usually, I mean, we have the discretion of when we feel that's appropriate, but they will always be reviewed by the, by the patient caring for the patient anyway. But what we would encourage is that there is good facility for these to be recorded electronically and good facility for that information to flow seamlessly between Hamish and myself so that there's no barriers between primary and secondary care and vice versa. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And Thanks, finally, Jerry. on this section, Alan. Uh, I, I realise that uh, we are ramping up uh, the number of tests at the moment. Uh, I wonder, could I be given a, a, a flavour of just uh, the time scale in terms of results uh, coming back uh, to the medical practitioners from these tests that are being conducted? In hospital, we're getting results within 24 hours, um, which is helpful. Uh, clearly, earlier is better, but uh, within 24 hours for most tests is, uh, allows us to make decisions in GP practice, what would be the, I mean, the people that are going to the, the drive-through testing centres and so forth, how quickly are those results coming back? Uh, so, so we wouldn't get as many results in the same way that Hamish would when he's requesting a test, but, but within the 24 hours, uh, and we would pay I mean, great testament to all the lab workers who've made that possible correctly. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you Lawrence, Hamish and, and Mark in his absence. Thank you very much for taking the time this morning to come and brief us on these very sensitive and difficult issues. Um, on behalf of the committee, I want to wish all of you the very best. And uh, I, I suppose you, you, you have a great responsibility in terms of the cure that you give people at the, at the end of their life and throughout their lives. And uh, I think we all respect the job that you do and wish you well in the very difficult times that still remain ahead. So thank you and good morning for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members. Thank you. So uh, we'll continue on then with uh, the rest of the meeting. So we have item seven here is the recovery uh, st- statutory regulation 2020 forward slash 34. The recovery of health service charges amounts amendment regulations 2020. Can I advise members that the Department has made a statutory rule to apply an inflationary uplift to the current tariff levels used for the collection of costs incurred by hospitals when treating casualties of road traffic accidents? The order came into operation on the 1st of April 2020, so it is subject to negative resolution. Members will remember the Committee first considered the SL1 policy proposal for this SR on the 27th of February and agreed to write to the Department seeking information on reciprocal arrangements in the south of Ireland and similar measures in Britain. The Department has since advised us that the EU-wide reciprocal arrangements exist and that the scheme in Britain is fundamentally the same. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the Committee and the Examiner of Statutory Rules has no issues to raise. 
Have members any other issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No issues, no issues on the phone? None, sure. Okay. So, then, therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 34, the recovery of health service charges amounts amendment regulations NA 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you, members. Now, moving on to correspondence. Can I refer members to correspondence at tab 8 of the pack and to the table papers and to the correspondence memo at tab 8.1? We'll first of all draw members' attention to item 8.2, which is a response from the Minister to the Committee's request for information regarding the Autism Strategy Progress Reports. So I'll ask members for views, but maybe Pam, could you maybe, uh, are you there at the minute? Do you have anything yeah. on that? Yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, I do fully appreciate and appreciate the very prompt response from the Department on the issue. Uh, and whilst we all understand um, that we're in the midst of a pandemic and things are certainly not easy or normal, I, I do think that questions still need to be asked in relation to um, what, where the Department has been during the last 10 years in dealing with the autism <coughs> strategy. So I, I would like to propose that we... Um, bring a draft response for for this particular um, letter back to uh, next week's meeting, if that's agreed. Are members content or any other views on that issue? Content that we bring a, a draft back to the next meeting? Yep, okay, that's agreed. At tab 8.8 .8 then, there's a draft response to correspondence which I uh, propose we uh, refer back to the clerk for updating. This correspondence was around in relation to the issue of abortion and we had had a discussion last week on that and there was then um, subsequent uh, changes in relation to department guidance around that. So I think we should maybe get that response updated before we agree. It's, it's a bit out of date following last week's Fair proceedings. Yep. Members agreed with that? Um, and then, are members content then otherwise with the correspondence memo? Yeah. And turning then to tabled papers, can I draw your attention to the following paper? At tab 8.14, we have received an email from the National Autistic Society asking for clarity on the guidance issued by the British government relaxing the rules on staying at home for people with learning disabilities and other complex needs. Um, I know the Deputy Chair raised this with the Minister yesterday, and I'm just wondering, do members have any comment or issues in relation to that correspondence to wish to note? Yes, Chair, could I have a comment? Yeah, Pam, go ahead. Yeah, Chair, yes, as you said, I raised this with the Minister yesterday at the Ad Hoc uh, Committee, and uh, he did agree to come back with some form of guidance. I've, I've also um, written to him uh, and uh, I've also CC the Chief Constable in on that for his commentary as well, because the current guidance that uh, we're looking at refers to care plans. And my belief is that that actually refers more to an English model than a Northern Ireland specific model. So I think it would be really vital that, that we get good guidance on this issue, because what we don't want to do is to uh, encourage um, those, for instance, with autism um, to be going out two and three times a day for exercise if that's not appropriate. Um, so I, I think it's very important that we get that clarification from the Minister and not that we get it urgently. So I have written on that already, so I'm hopeful that it, I'll get a response in the near future. Okay, and, and we do have, I remind members, the Minister um, the minister is, is in committee with us next week, so maybe we could raise it there uh, in relation to clarity on a, on a purpose-built model for here, which recognises the unique, the unique situation that we have here. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah I, sorry, I have, I have Jerry indicating first, Pat. I'll come back to you there. I, I would agree with that, Chair, but I mean, as a suggestion, you know, um, is it possible or, or can we, in our response to the strategy, can we have a line or two in our response to say that there should be? I think there was a concern raised with us in an, e in an email about people who, with autism who may be needlessly stopped. Um, I think by the police, I think there was a concern raised uh, with us about that. So, is it possible we can include a line or two about that in our response to the the, 
the email about the, the strategy, the autism strategy? Well, I think the stra- I think that is the that is the question within within the letter. So I think that's that's uh, that's inherent within it, if you like. Um, I'll just take a view from Pat there first before we sort of see where we're at, Pat. Uh, I think it was, mis- yeah. uh, it was myself, Colin, Colin McGrath here. Was, was right, Colin. Okay, um, right. Yeah, I tell you what it was. It was just, I was listening to the radio this morning briefly, and um, I think there might be some merit in seeking a view from the police, maybe via the chief constable, because um, the, the assistant chief constable was on this morning and was at great pains to point out that their interpretation of the legislation is that it's need based. So it says that if somebody needs to leave their home, if somebody needs to go a distance, and it's, a, it's that that they use as their gauge. And I think if we had clarity from them that they would accept that um, those with autism need to leave the house several times per day or that they need to travel to a particular place, then that would certainly clarify the matters. And if they could allow their officers to know that view, which they could do very quickly, it might help to very quickly circumnavigate uh, any issues or problems. Okay. Well, would it would it be fair enough that we forward we forward the to the department for clarification? We indicate that we will what we will be raising this issue next week, and we would like to have clarity on the issue, and that the that we include a line that the, the department uh, engages with the PSNA in relation to in relation to the guidance to be to be clear and consistent across the board. That. Chairman, there's a meeting yeah. of the policing board this afternoon. And I will uh, I expect that issue to, to be raised and, uh, and uh, replied to by the Chief Constable. So hopefully we may have something on the record as quickly as this afternoon and some okay. clarity around it. Thank you. Well, uh, and, and I suppose then, if, ideally, it will be resolved before next week. But if not, we certainly will want to. Um, so are members content with that broad approach? Content. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so at tab 8.15 then, we have an email from an individual highlighting the barriers to registered pharmacists in Britain from coming back here to, or from coming here, to, to come here to register. Um, there's a number of barriers highlighted within that letter. Are members content that we forward that to the Pharmaceutical Society for consideration before we take any further action? Content. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. At tab 8.16 is a copy of an open letter from scientists, health professionals and others who work with drug addicts, urging the government to increase support services to those suffering from drug addiction during the COVID-19 pandemic. Do members have any comments or suggestions in relation to that? And I know, Arlea, that you had forwarded the letter to the committee, and maybe you want to give us some context or, or comment? Um, yes, well, I'm not sure if members had a chance to um, read through, read over the letter, um, but it was maybe even if we could forward it on to the Department of Health. Um, can just you, to, Arlea, to sorry, can you, speak up? can you speak up a wee bit, Arlea? We're having bother hearing you. Sorry about that. You're okay. Um, it was just to see if members would be content to forward the letter on to the department to get their um, position on it. I'm not sure if everyone had a chance to read over it within the text, but it is flagging up some some issues around um, drug users and how they would be more sort of vulnerable um, to the, the COVID um, outbreak. Okay, Paula? Yeah, well, it, it links that into maybe the next item about forward planning. I think that it would be useful if we did get some evidence from people who are working with people who have drug addiction or have a dual diagnosis of mental health problems, because I do think that they're possibly particularly vulnerable at this time because services have closed down. So support or or Leah's suggestion, but I do think maybe in terms of people to come forward, I think that maybe like some of the community voluntary sector or the practitioners, but mental health is obviously something we really need to get an understanding of. Yep. Are members content with that twin track approach in, in relation to that, that we, we forward the letter and we also consider how we might engage with that sector and, and on that issue? Okay, thank you. Content, yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, members. So, uh, forward work programme then, I refer members to tab 9.1 of the, of the pack. Um, and I suppose, just in relation to our forward work generally, can I flag up with members that in order to minimise <laughs> physical presence in the building, we may need to move to Wednesday meetings from the 29th, 30th of April. Um, and I'll confirm those arrangements as time goes forward, but there has been an overall plan to try to reduce the physical presence inside the building to protect staff here. So um, 
We've already had one suggestion there in terms of for future meetings. I suppose we're trying to keep our agenda fairly flexible to react to the situation on the ground with COVID-19, but is there anything that members want to uh, say at the present time or any comments in relation to forward work? Yes, Chair. Yes. Just in, in terms of, um, and I think we've already agreed um, by the correspondence to um, follow the normal briefing with the um, British Association of Social Workers in Northern Ireland. I think that's very important and that would be good to hear from um, that particular organisation in the near future. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues that struck me during the week was in relation to the PPE and you know we know there has been a significant supply but there are clearly have been issues and, and concerns that, that for their issues as we move into the surge and it appears we are we are moving into that that surge period but I was thinking that um, BSO are the people who do a lot of the procurement ar around and, and the distribution of of uh, equipment so it might be good to get a detailed breakdown of what equipment they're ordering what equipment they have in stocks would, would members think that useful for future okay we'll, we'll have a look at that and see if we can any other comments yeah. on forward work yeah chair just just on your point there with bso that i think that would be very good and i don't know who exactly we could speak to in terms of um this kind of well for the department questioning how um agreements are, are formalized obviously there are lots of offers of help from the community and from different organizations and i know they probably more than one department is, is pretty much swamped with requests and offers of help as well. I'm just wondering, um, is there any way we can look at that going forward um, and seeing how that help can be formalised? Yeah, well, I suppose in the first instance, we could raise it with the Minister next week in terms of, in terms of how that's, from the health department point of view, that's being coordinated or progressed or, or, or marshalled, if you like. And then, then, then we can we can take a look at and if, it, if you have any other suggestions, Pam, in relation to how that how we might progress that, send them in. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So, are members content to note the forward work program as discussed? Yep. Thank you. Any other business today, members? Jerry. Yeah, Chair. Just obviously, we weren't due to meet the last two weeks with Easter recess, and I think it was important that we did. And I just want to put on my um, I put on the record my thanks to the committee staff for. Uh, accommodating us in that period. Obviously, there's an element of risk being here, but I think it's important that we, we scrutinise. So I just want to note my, my thanks to the, the committee staff for accommodating us generally, but especially in the last two weeks. Yeah, and I think it's it, it's not entirely accurate to say we want you to meet. What we had said was we would keep it under review, and I think it is it has been very useful now. The past the past couple of meetings that we have had um, have teased out some specific issues, and I think those have been quite important. So, and, and I, I also thank the staff for for in very uh, very difficult circumstances generally at present for pulling together meetings and short notice for for panels to come forward, and that does take quite a bit of coordination. And, and I'd like to acknowledge that as well and to endorse those comments. So, if there's no other business, then I'm going to move on to date, time, and place of next meeting. So the next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 23rd of April, 2020. Room to be confirmed. Members content. Thank you, Thank Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.